section one of the complete works of friedrich nietzsche volume three translated by j m kennedy this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the complete works of friedrich nietzsche volume three translator's introduction on the future of our educational institutions comprehends a series of five lectures delivered by nietzsche when professor of classical philology at basel university as they were prepared when he was only twenty-seven years of age we can scarcely expect to find in them that broad good european point of view which we meet with in his later works these lectures however are not only highly interesting in themselves but indispensable for those who wish to trace the gradual development of nietzsche's thought nietzsche's aim as is now pretty well known was the elevation of the type man at this period of his life he believed that this end could be best attained by the protection and careful development of men of genius hence his antagonism in the following lectures towards the purely time-serving german schools and colleges of his age in which culture was not only neglected but not even known the one aim of the teachers being to instruct the pupils in the art of getting on of playing a successful part in the struggle for existence of becoming useful citizens of course nietzsche was too little of a wild reformer to be adverse to a schooling of this nature he freely admits that a bread-winning education is necessary for the majority and that officials are necessary to the state but he adds that everything learnt as a preparation for taking part in the commercial or political battle of life has nothing to do with culture true culture is only for a few select minds which it is necessary to bring together under the protecting roof of an institution that shall prepare them for culture and for culture only such an institution he goes on to say does not yet exist but we must have it if the delicate flower of the german mind is no longer to be choked by the noxious weeds which have gathered round it as instances of minds thus choked nietzsche mentions lessing winkelmann and schiller the standard of culture to be aimed at by the man of genius nietzsche had in mind was to be found in the model literary and artistic works which have come down to us from ancient greece to understand these works of course the classical authors had to be studied in the original and the methods of teaching then in vogue paid too much attention to inconsequential points for example variant readings instead of dealing with the subject in a broad-minded philosophical spirit nietzsche endeavoured to counteract this tendency in the homer and classical philology his inaugural address at basel university by outlining a much vaster conception of philology than his fellow-teachers had ever dreamt of laying stress upon the artistic results which would accrue if the science were applied on a wider scale results which would be of a much higher order than those obtained by the narrow pedantry then prevailing it is a very superficial comment on these lectures to say that nietzsche was merely referring to the german schools and colleges of his time it would be even shallower to suggest that his remarks do not apply to the schools and teachers of present-day england and america for we likewise do not possess the cultural institution the real educational establishment that nietzsche longed for broadly speaking the english public schools the older english universities and the american high schools train their scholars to be useful to the state the modern universities and the remaining schools give that instruction in breadwinning which nietzsche admits to be necessary for the majority but in no case is an attempt made to pick out a few higher minds and train them for culture our crude methods of teaching the classical languages are too well known to be commented upon and an insight into classical antiquity 
with the good taste the firm principles and the lofty aims obtained therefrom is exactly what our various educational institutions do not aim at giving yet as nietzsche truly says no progress in any other direction no matter how brilliant can deliver our students from the curse of an education which adapts itself more and more to the needs of the age and thus loses all its power of guiding the age let the student who as the victim of this system suffers more from it than his teachers care to admit read the paragraph on pages one hundred and thirty two and one hundred and thirty three containing the sentences he feels that he can neither lead nor help himself his condition is undignified even dreadful he keeps between the two extremes of work at high pressure and a state of melancholy enervation he seeks consolation in hasty and incessant action so as to hide himself from himself etc and then let him confess that nietzsche's insight into his psychology is profound and decisive the whole paragraph might have been written by nietzsche after a visit to present-day england as bearing upon the same subject the reader will find it interesting to compare the lectures here translated with matthew arnold's prose writings passim particularly the essays and criticism mixed essays and culture and anarchy j m kennedy london may nineteen o nine end of section one section two of the complete works of friedrich nietzsche volume three this librivox recording is in the public domain the future of our educational institutions preface the reader from whom i expect something must possess three qualities he must be calm and must read without haste he must not be ever interposing his own personality and his own special culture and he must not expect as the ultimate results of his study of these pages that he will be presented with a set of new formulae i do not propose to furnish formulae or new plans of study for gymnasia or other schools and i am much more inclined to admire the extraordinary power of those who are able to cover the whole distance between the depths of empiricism and the heights of special culture problems and who again descend to the level of the driest rules and the most neatly expressed formulae i shall be content if only i can ascend a tolerably lofty mountain from the summit of which after having recovered my breath i may obtain a general survey of the ground for i shall never be able in this book to satisfy the votaries of tabulated rules indeed i see a time coming when serious men working together in the service of a completely rejuvenated and purified culture may again become the directors of a system of everyday instruction calculated to promote that culture and they will probably be compelled once more to draw up sets of rules but how remote this time now seems and what may not happen meanwhile it is just possible that between now and then all gymnasia yea and perhaps all universities may be destroyed or have become so utterly transformed that their very regulations may in the eyes of future generations seem to be but the relics of the cave dwellers age this book is intended for calm readers for men who have not yet been drawn into the mad headlong rush of our hurry scurrying age and who do not experience any idolatrous delight in throwing themselves beneath its chariot wheels it is for men therefore who are not accustomed to estimate the value of everything according to the amount of time it either saves or wastes in short it is for the few these we believe still have time without any qualms of conscience they may improve the most fruitful and vigorous hours of their day in meditating on the future of our education they may even believe when the evening has come that they have used their day in the most dignified and useful way namely in the meditatio generis futuri 
no one among them has yet forgotten to think while reading a book he still understands the secret of reading between the lines and is indeed so generous in what he himself brings to his study that he continues to reflect upon what he has read perhaps long after he has laid the book aside and he does this not because he wishes to write a criticism about it or even another book but simply because reflection is a pleasant pastime to him frivolous spendthrift thou art a reader after my own heart for thou wilt be patient enough to accompany an author any distance even though he himself cannot yet see the goal at which he is aiming even though he himself feels only that he must at all events honestly believe in a goal in order that a future and possibly very remote generation may come face to face with that towards which we are now blindly and instinctively groping should any reader demur and suggest that all that is required is prompt and bold reform should he imagine that a new organization introduced by the state were all that is necessary then we fear he would have misunderstood not only the author but the very nature of the problem under consideration the third and most important stipulation is that he should in no case be constantly bringing himself and his own culture forward after the style of most modern men as the correct standard and measure of all things we would have him so highly educated that he could even think meanly of his education or despise it altogether only thus would he be able to trust entirely to the author's guidance for it is only by virtue of ignorance and his consciousness of ignorance that the latter can dare to make himself heard finally the author would wish his reader to be fully alive to the specific character of our present barbarism and of that which distinguishes us as the barbarians and of that which distinguishes us as the barbarians of the nineteenth century from other barbarians now with this book in his hand the writer seeks all those who may happen to be wandering hither and thither impelled by feelings similar to his own allow yourselves to be discovered ye lonely ones in whose existence i believe ye unselfish ones suffering in yourselves from the corruption of the german spirit ye contemplative ones who cannot with hasty glances turn your eyes swiftly from one surface to another ye lofty thinkers of whom aristotle said that ye wander through life vacillating and inactive so long as no great honour or glorious cause calleth you to deeds it is you i summon refrain this once from seeking refuge in your lairs of solitude and dark misgivings bethink you that this book was framed to be your herald when ye shall go forth to battle in your full panoply who among you will not rejoice in looking back upon the herald who rallied you end of section two section three of the complete works of friedrich nietzsche volume three this librivox recording is in the public domain on the future of our educational institutions introduction the title i gave to these lectures ought like all titles to have been as definite as plain and as significant as possible now however observe that owing to a certain excess of precision in its present form it is too short and consequently misleading my first duty therefore will be to explain the title together with the object of these lectures to you and to apologize for being obliged to do this when i promise to speak to you concerning the future of our educational institutions i was not thinking especially of the evolution of our particular institutions in basel however frequently my general observations may seem to bear particular application to our own conditions here i personally have no desire to draw these inferences and do not wish to be held responsible if they should be drawn for the simple reason that i consider myself still far too much an inexperienced stranger among you 
and much too superficially acquainted with your methods to pretend to pass judgment upon any such special order of scholastic establishments or to predict the probable course their development will follow on the other hand i know full well under what distinguished auspices i have to deliver these lectures namely in a city which is striving to educate and enlighten its inhabitants on a scale so magnificently out of proportion to its size that it must put all larger cities to shame this being so i presume i am justified in assuming that in a quarter where so much is done for the things of which i wish to speak people must also think a good deal about them my desire yea my very first condition therefore would be to become united in spirit with those who have not only thought very deeply upon educational problems but have also the will to promote what they think to be right by all the means in their power and in view of the difficulties of my task and the limited time at my disposal to such listeners alone in my audience shall i be able to make myself understood and even then it will be on condition that they shall guess what i can do no more than suggest that they shall supply what i am compelled to omit and brief that they shall need but to be reminded and not to be taught thus while i disclaim all desire of being taken for an uninvited adviser on questions relating to the schools and the university of basel i repudiate even more emphatically still the role of a prophet standing on the horizon of civilization and pretending to predict the future of education and of scholastic organization i can no more project my vision through such vast periods of time than i can rely upon its accuracy when it is brought too close to an object under examination with my title our educational institutions i wish to refer neither to the establishments in basel nor to the incalculably vast number of other scholastic institutions which exist throughout the nations of the world to-day but i wish to refer to german institutions of the kind which we rejoice in here it is their future that will now engage our attention that is the future of german elementary secondary and public schools gymnasium and universities while pursuing our discussion however we shall for once avoid all comparisons and valuations and guard more especially against that flattering the illusion that our condition should be regarded as the standard for all others and as surpassing them let it suffice that they are our institutions that they have not become a part of ourselves by mere accident and were not laid upon us like a garment but that they are living monuments of important steps in the progress of civilization in some respects even the furniture of a bygone age and as such link us with the past of our people and are such a sacred and venerable legacy that i can only undertake to speak of the future of our educational institutions in the sense of their being a most probable approximation to the ideal spirit which gave them birth i am moreover convinced that the numerous alterations which have been introduced into these institutions within recent years with a view of bringing them up to date are for the most part but distortions and aberrations of the originally sublime tendencies given to them at their foundation and what we dare to hope from the future in this behalf partakes so much of the nature of a rejuvenation a revivescence and a refining of the spirit of germany that as a result of this very process our educational institutions may also be indirectly remoulded and born again so as to appear at once old and new whereas now they only profess to be modern or up-to-date now it is only in the spirit of the hope above mentioned that i wish to speak of the future of our educational institutions and this is a second point in regard to which i must tender an apology from the outset the prophet pose is such a presumptuous one that it seems almost ridiculous to deny that i have the intention of adopting it no one should attempt to describe the future of our education and the means and methods of instruction relating thereto in a prophetic spirit unless he can prove 
that the picture he draws already exists in germ to-day and that all that is required is the extension and development of this embryo if the necessary modifications are to be produced in schools and other educational institutions all i ask is like a roman heruspex to be allowed to steal glimpses of the future out of the very entrails of existing conditions which in this case means no more than to hand the laurels of victory to any one of the many forces tending to make itself felt in our present educational system despite the fact that the force in question may be neither a favourite an esteem nor a very extensive one i confidently assert that it will be victorious however because it has the strongest and mightiest of all allies in nature herself and in this respect it were well did we not forget that scores of the very first principles of our modern educational methods are thoroughly artificial and that the most fatal weaknesses of the present day are to be ascribed to this artificiality he who feels in complete harmony with the present state of affairs and who acquiesces in it as something selb self understood excites our envy neither in regard to his faith nor in regard to that egregious word so frequently heard in fashionable circles he however who holds the opposite view and is therefore in despair does not need to fight any longer all he requires is to give himself up to solitude in order soon to be alone albeit between those who take everything for granted and these anchorites there stand the fighters that is to say those who still have hope and as the noblest and sublimest example of this class we recognize schiller as he is described by goethe in his epilogue to the bell brighter now glowed his cheek and still more bright with that unchanging ever youthful glow that courage which o'er comes in hard-fought fight sooner or later every earthly foe that faith which soaring to the realms of light now boldly presseth on now bendeth low so that the good may work wax thrive amain so that the day the noble may attain i should like you to regard all i have just said as a kind of preface the object of which is to illustrate the title of my lectures and to guard me against any possible misunderstanding and unjustified criticisms and now in order to give you a rough outline of the range of ideas from which i shall attempt to form a judgment concerning our educational institutions before proceeding to disclose my views and turning from the title to the main theme i shall lay a scheme before you which like a court of arms will serve to warn all strangers who come to my door as to the nature of the house they are about to enter in case they may feel inclined after having examined the device to turn their backs on the premises that bear it my scheme is as follows two seemingly antagonistic forces equally deleterious in their actions and ultimately combining to produce their results are at present ruling over our educational institutions although these were based originally upon very different principles these forces are a striving to achieve the greatest possible extension of education on the one hand and a tendency to minimize and to weaken it on the other the first named would fain spread learning among the greatest possible number of people the second would compel education to renounce its highest and most independent claims in order to subordinate itself to the service of the state in the face of these two antagonistic tendencies we could but give ourselves up to despair did we not see the possibility of promoting the cause of two other contending factors which are fortunately as completely german as they are rich in promises for the future i refer to the present movement towards limiting and concentrating education as the antithesis of the first of the forces above mentioned and that other movement towards the strengthening and the independence of education as the antithesis of the second force if we should seek a warrant for our belief in the ultimate victory of the two last-named movements we could find it in the fact that both of the forces which we hold to be deleterious are so opposed to the eternal purpose of nature as the concentration of education for the few is in harmony with it and is true whereas the first two forces could succeed only in founding a culture false to the root End of section three
section four of the complete works of friedrich nietzsche volume three this librivox recording is in the public domain the future of our educational institutions first lecture delivered on the sixteenth of january eighteen seventy two ladies and gentlemen the subject i now propose to consider with you is such a serious and important one and is in a sense so disquieting that like you i would gladly turn to any one who could proffer some information concerning it were he ever so young were his ideas ever so improbable provided that he were able by the exercise of his own faculties to furnish some satisfactory and sufficient explanation it is just possible that he may have had the opportunity of hearing sound views expressed in reference to the vexed question of the future of our educational institutions and that he may wish to repeat them to you he may even have had distinguished teachers fully qualified to foretell what is to come and like the haru species of rome able to do so after an inspection of the entrails of the present indeed you yourselves may expect something of this kind from me i happened once in strange but perfectly harmless circumstances to overhear a conversation on this subject between two remarkable men and the more striking points of the discussion together with their manner of handling the theme are so indelibly imprinted on my memory that whenever i reflect on these matters i invariably find myself falling into their grooves of thought i cannot however profess to have the same courageous confidence which they displayed both in their daring utterance of forbidden truths and in the still more daring conception of the hopes with which they astonished me it therefore seemed to me to be in the highest degree important that a record of this conversation should be made so that others might be incited to form a judgment concerning the striking views and conclusions it contains and to this end i had special grounds for believing that i should do well to avail myself of the opportunity afforded by this course of lectures i am well aware of the nature of the community to whose serious consideration i now wish to commend that conversation i know it to be a community which is striving to educate and enlighten its members on a scale so magnificently out of proportion to its size that it must put all larger cities to shame this being so i presume i may take it for granted that in a quarter where so much is done for the things of which i wish to speak people must also think a good deal about them in my account of the conversation already mentioned i shall be able to make myself completely understood only to those among my audience who will be able to guess what i can do no more than suggest who will supply what i am compelled to omit and who above all need but to be reminded and not taught listen therefore ladies and gentlemen while i recount my harmless experience and the less harmless conversation between the two gentlemen whom so far i have not named let us now imagine ourselves in the position of a young student that is to say in a position which in our present age of bewildering movement and feverish excitability has become an almost impossible one it is necessary to have lived through it in order to believe that such careless self-lulling and comfortable indifference to the moment or to time in general are possible in this condition i and a friend about my own age spent a year at the university of bonn on the rhine it was a year which in its complete lack of plans and projects for the future seems almost like a dream to me now a dream framed as it were by two periods of growth we too remained quiet and peaceful although we were surrounded by fellows who in the main were very differently disposed and from time to time we experienced considerable difficulty in meeting and resisting the somewhat too pressing advances of the young men of our own age now however that i can look upon the stand we had to take against these 
opposing forces i cannot help associating them in my mind with those checks we are wont to receive in our dreams as for instance when we imagine we are able to fly and yet feel ourselves held back by some incomprehensible power i and my friend had many reminiscences in common and these dated from the period of our boyhood upwards one of these i must relate to you since it forms a sort of prelude to the harmless experience already mentioned on the occasion of a certain journey up the rhine which we had made together one summer it happened that he and i independently conceived the very same plan at the same hour and on the same spot and we were struck so by this unwonted coincidence that we determined to carry the plan out forthwith we resolved to found a kind of small club which would consist of ourselves and a few friends and the object of which would be to provide us with a stable and binding organization directing and adding interest to our creative impulses in art and literature or to put it more plainly each of us would be pledged to present an original piece of work to the club once a month either a poem a treatise an architectural design or a musical composition upon which each of the others in a friendly spirit would have to pass free and unrestrained criticism we thus hope by means of mutual correction to be able both to stimulate and to chasten our creative impulses and as a matter of fact the success of the scheme was such that we have both always felt a sort of respectful attachment for the hour and the place at which it first took shape in our minds this attachment was very soon transformed into a rite for we all agreed to go whenever it was possible to do so once a year to that lonely spot near rolandsek where on that summer's day while sitting together lost in meditation we were suddenly inspired by the same thought frankly speaking the rules which were drawn up on the formation of the club were never very strictly observed but owing to the very fact that we had many sins of omission on our conscience during our student year in bonn when we were once more on the banks of the rhine we firmly resolved not only to observe our rule but also to gratify our feelings and our sense of gratitude by reverently visiting that spot near rolandsek on the day appointed it was however with some difficulty that we were able to carry our plans into execution for on the very day we had selected for our excursion the large and lively students association which always hindered us in our flights did their utmost to put obstacles in our way and to hold us back our association had organized a general holiday excursion to rolandsek on the very day my friend and i had fixed upon the object of the outing being to assemble all its members for the last time at the close of the half-year and to send them home with pleasant recollections of their last hours together the day was a glorious one the weather was of the kind which in our climate at least only falls to our lot in late summer heaven and earth merged harmoniously with one another and glowing wondrously in the sunshine autumn freshness blended with the blue expanse above arrayed in the bright fantastic garb in which amid the gloomy fashions now reigning students alone may indulge we boarded a steamer which was gaily decorated in our honour and hoisted our flag on its mast from both banks of the river there came at intervals the sound of signal guns fired according to our orders with the view of acquainting both our host in rolandsek and the inhabitants in the neighbourhood with our approach i shall not speak of the noisy journey from the landing stage through the excited and expectant little place nor shall i refer to the esoteric jokes exchanged between ourselves I also make no mention of a feast which became both wild and noisy or of an extraordinary musical production in the execution of which whether as soloists or as chorus we all ultimately had to share and which i as musical adviser of our club had not only had to rehearse but was then forced to conduct towards the end of this piece which grew even wilder and which was sung to ever quicker time i made a sign to my friend and just as the last chord rang like a yell through the building he and i vanished leaving behind us a raging pandemonium in a moment we were in the refreshing and breathless stillness of nature the shadows were already lengthening the sun still shone steadily though it had sunk a good deal in the heavens and from the green and glittering waves of the rhine a cool breeze was wafted over our hot faces our solemn rite bound us only in so far as the latest hours of the day were concerned and we therefore determined to employ the last moments of clear daylight 
by giving ourselves up to one of our many hobbies at that time we were passionately fond of pistol shooting and both of us in later years found the skill we had acquired as amateurs of great use in our military career our club servant happened to know the somewhat distant and elevated spot which we used as a range and had carried our pistols there in advance the spot lay near the upper border of the wood which covered the lesser heights behind rolandsek it was a small uneven plateau close to the place we had consecrated in memory of its associations on a wooded slope alongside of our shooting range there was a small piece of ground which had been cleared of wood and which made an ideal halting place from it one could get a view of the rhine over the tops of the trees and the brushwood so that the beautiful undulating lines of the seven mountains and above all of the drachenfels bounded the horizon against the group of trees while in the centre of the bow formed by the glistening rhine itself the island of nunnenwirth stood out as if suspended in the river's arms this was the place which had become sacred to us through the dreams and plans we had had in common and to which we intended to withdraw later in the evening nay to which we should be obliged to withdraw if we wished to close the day in accordance with the law we had imposed on ourselves at one end of the little uneven plateau and not very far away there stood the mighty trunk of an oak tree prominently visible against a background quite bare of trees and consisting merely of low undulating hills in the distance working together we had once carved a pentagram in the side of this tree trunk years of exposure to rain and storm had slightly deepened the channels we had cut and the figure seemed a welcome target for our pistol practice it was already late in the afternoon when we reached our improvised range and our oak stump cast a long and attenuated shadow across the barren heath all was still thanks to the lofty trees at our feet we were unable to catch a glimpse of the valley of the rhine below the peacefulness of the spot seemed only to intensify the loudness of our pistol shots and i had scarcely fired my second barrel at the pentagram when i felt some one lay hold of my arm and noticed that my friend had also some one beside him who had interrupted his loading turning sharply on my heels i found myself face to face with an astonished old gentleman and felt what must have been a very powerful dog make a lunge at my back my friend had been approached by a somewhat younger man than i had but before we could give expression to our surprise the older of the two interlopers burst forth in the following threatening and heated strain no no he called to us no duels must be fought here but least of all must you young students fight one away with these pistols and compose yourselves be reconciled shake hands what and are you the salt of the earth the intelligence of the future the seed of our hopes and are you not even able to emancipate yourselves from the insane code of honour and its violent regulations i will not cast any aspersions on your hearts but your heads certainly do you no credit you whose youth is watched over by the wisdom of greece and rome and whose youthful spirits at the cost of enormous pains have been flooded with the light of the sages and heroes of antiquity can you not refrain from making the code of knightly honour that is to say the code of folly and brutality the guiding principle of your conduct examine it rationally once and for all and reduce it to plain terms lay its pitiable narrowness bare and let it be the touchstone not of your hearts but of your minds if you do not regret it then it will merely show that your head is not fitted for work in a sphere where great gifts of discrimination are needful in order to burst the bonds of prejudice and where a well-balanced understanding is necessary for the purpose of distinguishing right from wrong even when the difference between them lies deeply hidden and is not as in this case so ridiculously obvious in that case therefore my lads try to go through life in some other honourable manner join the army or learn a handicraft that pays its way to this rough though admittedly just 
flood of eloquence we replied with some irritation interrupting each other continually in so doing in the first place you are mistaken concerning the main point for we are not here to fight a duel at all but rather to practise pistol-shooting secondly you do not appear to know how a real duel is conducted do you suppose that we should have faced each other in this lonely spot like two highwaymen without seconds or doctors etc etc thirdly with regard to the question of duelling we each have our own opinions and do not require to be waylaid and surprised by the sort of instruction you may feel disposed to give us this reply which was certainly not polite made a bad impression upon the old man at first when he heard that we were not about to fight a duel he surveyed us more kindly but when we reached the last passage of our speech he seemed so vexed that he growled when however we began to speak of our point of view he quickly caught hold of his companion turned sharply round and cried to us in bitter tones people should not have points of view but thoughts and then his companion added be respectful when a man such as this even makes mistakes meanwhile my friend who had reloaded fired a shot at the pentagram after having cried look out this sudden report behind his back made the old man savage once more he turned round and looked sourly at my friend after which he said to his companion in a feeble voice what shall we do these young men will be the death of me with their firing you should know said the younger man turning to us that your noisy pastimes amount as it happens on this occasion to an attempt upon the life of philosophy you observe this venerable man he is in a position to beg you to desist from firing here and when such a man begs well his request is generally granted the old man interjected surveying us sternly as a matter of fact we did not know what to make of the whole matter we could not understand what our noisy pastimes could have in common with philosophy nor could we see why out of regard for polite scruples we should abandon our shooting range and at this moment we may have appeared somewhat undecided and perturbed the companion noticing our momentary discomfiture proceeded to explain the matter to us we are compelled he said to linger in this immediate neighbourhood for an hour or so we have a rendezvous here an eminent friend of this eminent man is to meet us here this evening and we had actually selected this peaceful spot with its few benches in the midst of the wood for the meeting it would really be most unpleasant if owing to your continual pistol practice we were to be subjected to an unending series of shocks surely your own feelings will tell you that it is impossible for you to continue your firing when you hear that he who has selected this quiet and isolated place for a meeting with a friend is one of our most eminent philosophers this explanation only succeeded in perturbing us the more for we saw a danger threatening us which was even greater than the loss of our shooting range and we asked eagerly where is this quiet spot surely not to the left here in the wood that is the very place but this evening that place belongs to us my friend interposed we must have it we cried together our long projected celebration seemed at that moment more important than all the philosophies of the world and we gave such vehement and animated utterance to our sentiments that in view of the incomprehensible nature of our claims we must have cut a somewhat ridiculous figure at any rate our philosophical interlopers regarded us with expressions of amused inquiry as if they expected us to proffer some sort of apology but we were silent for we wished above all to keep our secret thus we stood facing one another in silence while the sunset dyed the tree-tops a ruddy gold the philosopher contemplated the sun his companion contemplated him and we turned our eyes towards our nook in the woods which to-day we seemed in such great danger of losing a feeling of sullen anger took possession of us what is philosophy we asked ourselves if it prevents a man from being by himself or from enjoying the select company of a friend in sooth if it prevents him from becoming a philosopher for we regarded the celebration of our right as a thoroughly philosophical performance in celebrating it we wished to form plans and resolutions for the future 
by means of quiet reflections we hoped to light upon an idea which would once again help us to form and gratify our spirit in the future just as that former idea had done during our boyhood the solemn act derived its very significance from this resolution then nothing definite was to be done we were only to be alone and to sit still and meditate as we had done five years before when we had each been inspired with the same thought it was to be a silent solemnization all reminiscence and all future the present was to be as a hyphen between the two and fate now unfriendly had just stepped into our magic circle and we knew not how to dismiss her the very unusual character of the circumstances filled us with mysterious excitement while we stood thus in silence for some time divided into two hostile groups the clouds above waxed ever redder and the evening seemed to grow more peaceful and mild we could almost fancy we heard the regular breathing of nature as she put the final touches to her work of art the glorious day we had just enjoyed when suddenly the calm evening air was rent by a confused and boisterous cry of joy which seemed to come from the rhine a number of voices could be heard in the distance they were those of our fellow-students who by that time must have taken to the rhine in small boats it occurred to us that we should be missed and that we should also miss something almost simultaneously my friend and i raised our pistols our shots were echoed back to us and with their echo there came from the valley the sound of a well-known cry intended as a signal of identification for our passion for shooting had brought us both repute and ill repute in our club at the same time we were conscious that our behaviour towards the silent philosophical couple had been exceptionally ungentlemanly they had been quietly contemplating us for some time and when we fired the shock made them draw close up to each other we hurried up to them and each in our turn cried out forgive us that was our last shot and it was intended for our friends on the rhine they have understood us do you hear if you insist upon having that place among the trees grant us at least the permission to recline there also you will find a number of benches on the spot we shall not disturb you we shall sit quiet still and shall not utter a word but it is now past seven o'clock and we must go there at once that sounds more mysterious than it is i added after a pause we have made a solemn vow to spend this coming hour on that ground and there were reasons for the vow the spot is sacred to us owing to some pleasant associations it must also inaugurate a good future for us we shall therefore endeavour to leave you with no disagreeable recollections of our meeting even though we have done much to perturb and frighten you the philosopher was silent his companion however said our promises and plans unfortunately compel us not only to remain but also to spend the same hour on the spot you have selected it is left for us to decide whether fate or perhaps a spirit has been responsible for this extraordinary coincidence besides my friend said the philosopher i am not half so displeased with these warlike youngsters as i was did you observe how quiet they were a moment ago when we were contemplating the sun they neither spoke nor smoked they stood stone still i even believe they meditated turning suddenly in our direction he said were you meditating just tell me about it as we proceed in the direction of our common trysting place we took a few steps together and went down the slope into the warm balmy air of the woods where it was already much darker on the way my friend openly revealed his thoughts to the philosopher he confessed how much he had feared that perhaps to-day for the first time a philosopher was about to stand in the way of his philosophizing the sage laughed what you were afraid a philosopher would prevent your philosophizing this might easily happen and you have not yet experienced such a thing has your university life been free from experience you surely attend lectures on philosophy this question discomfited us for as a matter of fact there had been no element of philosophy in our education up to that time in those days moreover we fondly imagined that everybody who held the post and possessed the dignity of a philosopher must perforce be one we were inexperienced and badly informed we frankly admitted that we had not yet belonged to any philosophical college but that we would certainly make up for lost time then what he asked did you mean when you spoke of philosophizing said i we are at a loss for a definition but to all intents and purposes we meant this that we wished to make earnest endeavours to consider the best possible means of becoming men of culture 
that is a good deal and at the same time very little growled the philosopher just you think the matter over here are our benches let us discuss the question exhaustively i shall not disturb your meditations with regard to how you are to become men of culture i wish you success and points of view as in your duelling questions brand new original and enlightened points of view the philosopher does not wish to prevent your philosophizing but refrain at least from disconcerting him with your pistol shots try to imitate the pythagoreans to-day they as servants of a true philosophy had to remain silent for five years possibly you may also be able to remain silent for five times fifteen minutes as servants of your own future culture about which you seem so concerned we had reached our destination the solemnization of our rite began as on the previous occasion five years ago the rhine was once more flowing beneath a light mist the sky seemed bright and the woods exhaled the same fragrance we took our places on the farthest corner of the most distant bench sitting there we were almost concealed and neither the philosopher nor his companion could see our faces we were alone when the sound of the philosopher's voice reached us it had become so blended with the rustling leaves and with the buzzing murmur of the myriads of living things inhabiting the wooded height that it almost seemed like the music of nature as a sound it resembled nothing more than a distant monotonous plaint we were indeed undisturbed some time elapsed in this way and while the glow of sunset grew steadily paler the recollection of our youthful undertaking in the cause of culture waxed ever more vivid it seemed to us as if we owed the greatest debt of gratitude to that little society we had founded for it had done more than merely supplement our public school training it had actually been the only fruitful society we had had and within its frame we even placed our public school life as a purely isolated factor helping us in our general efforts to attain to culture we knew this that thanks to our little society no thought of embracing any particular career had ever entered our minds in those days the all too frequent exploitation of youth by the state for its own purposes that is to say so that it may rear useful officials as quickly as possible and guarantee their unconditional obedience to it by means of excessively severe examinations had remained quite foreign to our education and to show how little we had been actuated by thoughts of utility or by the prospect of speedy advancement and rapid success on that day we were struck by the comforting consideration that even then we had not yet decided what we should be we had not even troubled ourselves at all on this head our little society had sown the seeds of this happy indifference in our souls and for it alone we were prepared to celebrate the anniversary of its foundation with hearty gratitude i have already pointed out i think that in the eyes of the present age which is so intolerant of anything that is not useful such purposeless enjoyment of the moment such a lulling of one's self in the cradle of the present must seem almost incredible and at all events blameworthy how useless we were and how proud we were of being useless we used even to quarrel with each other as to which of us should have the glory of being the more useless we wished to attach no importance to anything to have strong views about nothing to aim at nothing we wanted to take no thought for the morrow and desired no more than to recline comfortably like good-for-nothings on the threshold of the present and we did bless us that ladies and gentlemen was our standpoint then absorbed in these reflections i was just about to give an answer to the question of the future of our educational institutions in the same self-sufficient way when it gradually dawned upon me that the natural music coming from the philosopher's bench had lost its original character and travelled to us in much more piercing and distinct tones than before suddenly i became aware that i was listening that i was eavesdropping and was passionately interested with both ears keenly alive to every sound i nudged my friend who was evidently somewhat tired and i whispered don't fall asleep there is something for us to learn over there it applies to us even though it be not meant for us 
for instance i heard the younger of the two men defending himself with great animation while the philosopher rebuked him with ever-increasing vehemence you are unchanged he cried to him unfortunately unchanged it is quite incomprehensible to me how you can still be the same as you were seven years ago when i saw you for the last time and left you with so much misgiving i fear i must once again divest you however reluctantly of the skin of modern culture which you have donned meanwhile and what do i find beneath it the same immutable intelligible character forsooth according to kant but unfortunately the same unchanged intellectual character too which may also be a necessity though not a comforting one i ask myself to what purpose have i lived as a philosopher if possessed as you are of no mean intelligence and a genuine thirst for knowledge all the years you have spent in my company have left no deeper impression upon you at present you are behaving as if you had not even heard the cardinal principle of all culture which i went to such pains to inculcate upon you during our former intimacy tell me what was that principle i remember replied the scolded pupil you used to say no one would strive to attain to culture if he knew how incredibly small the number of really cultured people actually is and can ever be and even this number of really cultured people would not be possible if a prodigious multitude from reasons opposed to their nature and only led on by an alluring delusion did not devote themselves to education it were therefore a mistake publicly to reveal the ridiculous disproportion between the number of really cultured people and the enormous magnitude of the educational apparatus here lies the whole secret of culture namely that an innumerable host of men struggle to achieve it and work hard to that end ostensibly in their own interests whereas at bottom it is only in order that it may be possible for the few to attain to it that is the principle said the philosopher and yet you could so far forget yourself as to believe that you are one of the few this thought has occurred to you i can see that however is the result of the worthless character of modern education the rights of genius are being democratized in order that people may be relieved of the labor of acquiring culture and their need of it every one wants if possible to recline in the shade of a tree planted by genius and to escape the dreadful necessity of working for him so that his procreation may be made possible what are you too proud to be a teacher do you despise the thronging multitude of learners do you speak contemptuously of the teacher's calling and aping my mode of life would you fain live in solitary seclusion hostily isolated from that multitude do you suppose that you can reach at one bound what i ultimately have to win for myself only after long and determined struggles in order even to be able to live like a philosopher and do you not fear that solitude will wreak its vengeance upon you just try living the life of a hermit of culture one must be blessed with overflowing wealth in order to live for the good of all on one's own resources extraordinary youngsters they felt it incumbent upon them to imitate what is precisely most difficult and most high what is possible only to the master when they above all should know how difficult and dangerous this is and how many excellent gifts may be ruined by attempting it i will conceal nothing from you sir the companion replied i have heard too much from your lips at odd times and have been too long in your company to be able to surrender myself entirely to our present system of education and instruction i am too painfully conscious of the disastrous errors and abuses to which you used to call my attention though i very well know that i am not strong enough to hope for any success were i to struggle ever so valiantly against them i was overcome by a feeling of general discouragement my recourse to solitude was the result neither of pride nor arrogance i would fain describe to you what i take to be the nature of the educational questions now attracting such enormous and pressing attention 
it seemed to me that i must recognize two main directions in the forces at work two seemingly antagonistic tendencies equally deleterious in their action and ultimately combining to produce their results a striving to achieve the greatest possible expansion of education on the one hand and a tendency to minimize and weaken it on the other the first named would for various reasons spread learning among the greatest number of people the second would compel education to renounce its highest noblest and sublimest claims in order to subordinate itself to some other department of life such as the service of the state i believe i have already hinted at the quarter in which the cry for the greatest possible expansion of education is most loudly raised this expansion belongs to the most beloved of the dogmas of modern political economy as much knowledge and education as possible therefore the greatest possible supply and demand hence as much happiness as possible that is the formula in this case utility is made the object and goal of education utility in the sense of gain the greatest possible pecuniary gain in the quarter now under consideration culture would be defined as that point of vantage which enables one to keep in the van of one's age from which one can see all the easiest and best roads to wealth and with which one controls all the means of communication between men and nations the purpose of education according to this scheme would be to rear the most current men possible current being used here in the sense in which it is applied to the coins of the realm the greater the number of such men the happier a nation will be and this precisely is the purpose of our modern educational institutions to help every one as far as his nature will allow to become current to develop him so that his particular degree of knowledge and science may yield him the greatest possible amount of happiness and pecuniary gain every one must be able to form some sort of estimate of himself he must know how much he may reasonably expect from life the bond between intelligence and property which this point of view postulates has almost the force of a moral principle in this quarter all culture is loathed which isolates which sets goals beyond gold and gain and which requires time it is customary to dispose of such eccentric tendencies in education as systems of higher egotism or of immoral culture epicureanism according to the morality reigning here the demands are quite different what is required above all is rapid education so that a money-earning creature may be produced with all speed there is even a desire to make this education so thorough that a creature may be reared that will be able to earn a great deal of money men are allowed only the precise amount of culture which is compatible with the interests of gain but that amount at least is expected from them in short mankind has a necessary right to happiness on earth that is why culture is necessary but on that account alone i must just say something here said the philosopher in the case of the view you have described so clearly there arises the great and awful danger that at some time or other the great masses may overleap the middle classes and spring headlong into this earthly bliss that is what is now called the social question it might seem to these masses that education for the greatest number of men was only a means to the earthly bliss of the few the greatest possible expansion of education so enfeebles education that it can no longer confer privileges or inspire respect the most general form of culture is simply barbarism but i do not wish to interrupt your discussion the companion continued there are yet other reasons besides this beloved economical dogma for the expansion of education that is being striven after so valiantly everywhere in some countries the fear of religious oppression is so general and the dread of its results so marked that people in all classes of society long for culture and eagerly absorb those elements of it which are supposed to scatter the religious instincts elsewhere the state in its turn strives here and there for its own preservation after the greatest possible expansion of education because it always feels strong enough to bring the most 
determined emancipation resulting from culture under its yoke and readily approves of everything which tends to extend culture provided that it be of service to its officials or soldiers but in the main to itself in its competition with other nations in this case the foundations of a state must be sufficiently broad and firm to constitute a fitting counterpart to the complicated arches of culture which it supports just as in the first case the traces of some former religious tyranny must still be felt for a people to be driven to such desperate remedies thus wherever i hear the masses raise the cry for an expansion of education i am wont to ask myself whether it is stimulated by a greedy lust of gain and property by the memory of a former religious persecution or by the prudent egotism of the state itself on the other hand it seemed to me that there was yet another tendency not so clamorous perhaps but quite as forcible which hailing from various quarters was animated by a different desire the desire to minimize and weaken education in all cultivated circles people are in the habit of whispering to one another words something after this style that it is a general fact that owing to the present frantic exploitation of the scholar in the service of his science his education becomes every day more accidental and more uncertain for the study of science has been extended to such interminable lengths that he who though not exceptionally gifted yet possesses fair abilities will need to devote himself exclusively to one branch and ignore all others if he ever wished to achieve anything in his work should he then elevate himself above the herd by means of his speciality he still remains one of them in regard to all else that is to say in regard to all the most important things in life thus a specialist in science gets to resemble nothing so much as a factory workman who spends his whole life in turning one particular screw or handle on a certain instrument or machine at which occupation he acquires the most consummate skill in germany where we know how to drape such painful facts with the glorious garments of fancy this narrow specialization on the part of our learned men is even admired and their ever greater deviation from the path of true culture is regarded as a moral phenomenon fidelity in small things dogged faithfulness become expressions of highest eulogy and the lack of culture outside the speciality is flaunted abroad as a sign of noble sufficiency for centuries it has been an understood thing that one alluded to scholars alone when one spoke of cultured men but experience tells us that it would be difficult to find any necessary relation between the two classes to-day for at present the exploitation of a man for the purpose of science is accepted everywhere without the slightest scruple who still ventures to ask what may be the value of a science which consumes its minions in this vampire fashion the division of labour in science is practically struggling towards the same goal which religions in certain parts of the world are consciously striving after that is to say towards the decrease and even the destruction of learning that however which in the case of certain religions is a perfectly justifiable aim both in regard to their origin and their history can only amount to self-immolation when transferred to the realm of science in all matters of a general and serious nature and above all in regard to the highest philosophical problems we have now already reached a point at which the scientific man as such is no longer allowed to speak on the other hand that adhesive and tenacious stratum which has now filled up the interstices between the sciences journalism believes it has a mission to fulfil here and this it does according to its own particular lights that is to say as its name implies after the fashion of a day labourer it is precisely in journalism that the two tendencies combine and become one the expansion and the diminution of education here join hands the newspaper actually steps into the place of culture and he who even as a scholar wishes to voice any claim for education must avail himself of this viscous stratum of communication which cements the seams between all forms of life all classes all arts and all sciences 
and which is as firm and reliable as newspaper is as a rule in the newspaper the peculiar educational aims of the present culminate just as the journalist the servant of the moment has stepped into the place of the genius of the leader for all time of the deliverer from the tyranny of the moment now tell me distinguished master what hopes could i still have in a struggle against the general topsy turvification of all genuine aims for education with what courage can i a single teacher step forward when i know that the moment any seeds of real culture are sown they will be mercilessly crushed by the roller of this pseudo culture imagine how useless the most energetic work on the part of an individual teacher must be who would fain lead a pupil back into the distant and evasive hellenic world and to the real home of culture when in less than an hour that same pupil will have recourse to a newspaper the latest novel or one of those learned books the very style of which already bears the revolting impress of modern barbaric culture now silence a minute interjected the philosopher in a strong and sympathetic voice i understand you now and ought never to have spoken so crossly to you you are altogether right save in your despair i shall now proceed to say a few words of consolation End of section four. Section five of the complete works of Friedrich Nietzsche, volume three. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Second lecture delivered on the sixth of February, eighteen seventy two ladies and gentlemen those among you whom i now have the pleasure of addressing for the first time and whose only knowledge of my first lecture has been derived from reports will i hope not mind being introduced here into the middle of a dialogue which i had begun to recount on the last occasion and the last points of which i must now recall the philosopher's young companion was just pleading openly and confidentially with his distinguished tutor and apologizing for having so far renounced his calling as a teacher in order to spend his days in comfortless solitude no suspicion of superciliousness or arrogance had induced him to form this resolve i have heard too much from your lips at various times the straightforward people said and have been too long in your company to surrender myself blindly to our present systems of education and instruction i am too painfully conscious of the disastrous errors and abuses to which you were wont to call my attention and yet i know that i am far from possessing the requisite strength to meet with success however valiantly i might struggle to shatter the bulwarks of this would-be culture i was overcome by a general feeling of depression my recourse to solitude was not arrogance or superciliousness whereupon to account for his behaviour he described the general character of modern educational methods so vividly that the philosopher could not help interrupting him in a voice full of sympathy and crying words of comfort to him now silence for a minute my poor friend he cried i can more easily understand you now and should not have lost my patience with you you are altogether right save in your despair i shall now proceed to say a few words of comfort to you how long do you suppose the state of education in the schools of our time which seems to weigh so heavily upon you will last i shall not conceal my views on this point from you its time is over its days are counted the first who will dare to be quite straightforward in this respect will hear his honesty re-echoed back to him by thousands of courageous souls for at bottom there is a tacit understanding between the more nobly gifted and more warmly disposed men of the present day every one of them knows what he has had to suffer from the condition of culture in schools every one of them would fain protect his offspring from the need of enduring similar drawbacks even though he himself was compelled to submit to them 
if these feelings are never quite honestly expressed however it is owing to a sad want of spirit among modern pedagogues these lack real initiative there are too few practical men among them that is to say too few who happen to have good and new ideas and who know that real genius and the real practical mind must necessarily come together in the same individuals whilst the sober practical men have no ideas and therefore fall short in practice let any one examine the pedagogic literature of the present he who is not shocked at its utter poverty of spirit and its ridiculously awkward antics is beyond being spoiled here our philosophy must not begin with wonder but with dread he who feels no dread at this point must be asked not to meddle with pedagogic questions the reverse of course has been the rule up to the present those who were terrified ran away filled with embarrassment as you did my poor friend while the sober and fearless ones spread their heavy hands over the most delicate technique that has ever existed in art over the technique of education this however will not be possible much longer at some time or other the upright man will appear who will not only have the good ideas i speak of but who in order to work at their realization will dare to break with all that exists at present he may by means of a wonderful example achieve what the broad hands hitherto active could not even imitate then people will everywhere begin to draw comparisons then men will at least be able to perceive a contrast and will be in a position to reflect upon its causes whereas at present so many still believe in perfect good faith that heavy hands are a necessary factor in pedagogic work my dear master said the younger man i wish you could point to one single example which would assist me in seeing the soundness of the hopes which you so heartily raise in me we are both acquainted with public schools do you think for instance that in respect of these institutions anything may be done by means of honesty and good and new ideas to abolish the tenacious and antiquated customs now extant in this quarter it seems to me the battering rams of an attacking party will have to meet with no solid wall but with the most fatal of stolid and slippery principles the leader of the assault has no visible and tangible opponent to crush but rather a creature in disguise that can transform itself into a hundred different shapes and in each of these slip out of his grasp only in order to reappear and to confound its enemy by cowardly surrenders and feigned retreats it was precisely the public schools which drove me into despair and solitude simply because i feel that if the struggle here leads to victory all other educational institutions must give in but that if the reformer be forced to abandon his cause here he may as well give up all hope in regard to every other scholastic question therefore dear master enlighten me concerning the public schools what can we hope for in the way of their abolition or reform i also hold the question of public schools to be as important as you do the philosopher replied all other educational institutions must fix their aims in accordance with those of the public school system whatever errors of judgment it may suffer from they suffer from also and if it were ever purified and rejuvenated they would be purified and rejuvenated too the universities can no longer lay claim to this importance as centres of influence seeing that as they now stand they are at least in one important aspect only a kind of annex to the public school system as i shall shortly point out to you for the moment let us consider together what to my mind constitutes the very hopeful struggle of the two possibilities either that the motley and evasive spirit of public schools which has hitherto been fostered 
will completely vanish or that it will have to be completely purified and rejuvenated and in order that i may not shock you with general propositions let us first try to recall one of those public school experiences which we have all had and from which we have all suffered under severe examination what as a matter of fact is the present system of teaching german in public schools i shall first of all tell you what it should be everybody speaks and writes german as thoroughly badly as it is just possible to do so in an age of newspaper german that is why the growing youth who happens to be both noble and gifted has to be taken by force and put under the glass shade of good taste and of severe linguistic discipline if this is not possible i would prefer in future that latin be spoken for i am ashamed of a language so bungled and vitiated what would be the duty of a higher educational institution in this respect if not this namely with authority and dignified severity to put youths neglected as far as their own language is concerned on the right path and to cry to them take your own language seriously he who does not regard this matter as a sacred duty does not possess even the germ of a higher culture from your attitude in this matter from your treatment of your mother tongue we can judge how highly or how lowly you esteem art and to what extent you are related to it if you notice no physical loathing in yourselves when you meet with certain words and tricks of speech in our journalistic jargon cease from striving after culture for here in your immediate vicinity at every moment of your life while you are either speaking or writing you have a touchstone for testing how difficult how stupendous the task of the cultured man is and how very improbable it must be that many of you will ever attain to culture in accordance with the spirit of this address the teacher of german at a public school would be forced to call his pupils attention to thousands of details and with the absolute certainty of good taste to forbid their using such words and expressions for instance as beinsprucken veranahamen einer sache rechung tragen dia initiativ ergreifen selbstiver standlich etc come tedio in infinitum the same teacher would also have to take our classical authors and show line for line how carefully and with what precision every expression has to be chosen when a writer has the correct feeling in his heart and has before his eyes a perfect conception of all he is writing he would necessarily urge his pupils time and again to express the same thought ever more happily nor would he have to abate in rigour until the less gifted in his class had contracted an unholy fear of their language and the others had developed great enthusiasm for it here then is a task for so-called formal education the education tending to develop the mental faculties as opposed to material education which is intended to deal only with the acquisition of facts for example history mathematics etc and one of the utmost value but what do we find in the public school that is to say in the headquarters of formal education he who understands how to apply what he has heard here will also know what to think of the modern public school as a so-called educational institution he will discover for instance that the public school according to its fundamental principles does not educate for the purposes of culture but for the purposes of scholarship and further that of late it seems to have adopted a course which indicates rather that it has even discarded scholarship in favour of journalism as the object of its exertions this can be clearly seen from the way in which german is taught instead of that purely practical method of instruction by which the teacher accustoms his pupils to severe self-discipline in their own language we find everywhere the rudiments of a historico-scholastic method of teaching the mother tongue that is to say people deal with it as if it were a dead language and as if the present and future were under no obligations 
to it whatsoever the historical method has become so universal in our time that even the living body of the language is sacrificed for the sake of anatomical study but this is precisely where culture begins namely in understanding how to treat the quick as something vital and it is here too that the mission of the cultured teacher begins in suppressing the urgent claims of historical interests wherever it is above all necessary to do properly and not merely to know properly our mother tongue however is a domain in which the pupil must learn how to do properly and to this practical end alone the teaching of german is essential in our scholastic establishments the historical method may certainly be a considerably easier and more comfortable one for the teacher it also seems to be compatible with a much lower grade of ability and in general with a smaller display of energy and will on his part but we shall find that this observation holds good in every department of pedagogic life the simpler and more comfortable method always masquerades in the disguise of grand pretensions and stately titles the really practical side the doing which should belong to culture and which at bottom is the more difficult side meets only with disfavour and contempt that is why the honest man must make himself and others quite clear concerning this quid pro quo now apart from these learned incentives to a study of the language what is there besides which the german teacher is wont to offer how does he reconcile the spirit of his school with the spirit of the few that germany can claim who are really cultured that is with the spirit of its classical poets and artists this is a dark and thorny spear into which one cannot even bear a light without dread but even here we shall conceal nothing from ourselves for sooner or later the whole of it will have to be reformed in the public school the repulsive impress of our aesthetic journalism is stamped upon the still unformed minds of youths here too the teacher sows the seeds of that crude and wilful misinterpretation of the classics which later on disports itself as art criticism and which is nothing but bumptious barbarity here the pupils learn to speak of our unique schiller with the superciliousness of prigs here they are taught to smile at the noblest and most german of his works at the marquis of posa at max and Fechler. at these smiles german genius becomes incensed and a worthier posterity will blush the last department in which the german teacher in a public school is at all active which is often regarded as his sphere of highest activity and is here and there even considered the pinnacle of public school education is the so-called german composition owing to the very fact that in this department it is almost always the most gifted pupils who display the greatest eagerness it ought to have been made clear how dangerously stimulating precisely here the task of the teacher must be german composition makes an appeal to the individual and the more strongly a pupil is conscious of his various qualities the more personally will he do his german composition this personal doing is urged on with yet an additional fillip in some public schools by the choice of the subject the strongest proof of which is in my opinion that even in the lower classes the non-pedagogic subject is set by means of which the pupil is led to give a description of his life and of his development now one is only to read the titles of the compositions set in a large number of public schools to be convinced that probably the large majority of pupils have to suffer their whole lives through no fault of their own owing to this premature demand for personal work for the unripe procreation of thoughts and how often are not all a man's subsequent literary performances but a sad result of this pedagogic original sin against the intellect let us only think of what takes place at such an age in the production of such work it is the first individual creation the still undeveloped powers tend for the first time to crystallize the staggering sensation produced by the demand for self-reliance imparts a seductive charm to these early performances which is not only quite new but which never returns all the daring of nature is hauled out of its depths 
all vanities no longer constrained by mighty barriers are allowed for the first time to assume a literary form the young man from that time forward feels as if he had reached his consummation as a being not only able but actually invited to speak and to converse the subject he selects obliges him either to express his judgment upon certain poetical works to class historical persons together in a description of character to discuss serious ethical problems quite independently or even to turn the searchlight inwards to throw its rays upon his own development and to make a critical report of himself in short a whole world of reflection is spread out before the astonished young man who until then had been almost unconscious and is delivered up to him to be judged now let us try to picture the teacher's usual attitude towards these first highly influential examples of original composition what does he hold to be most reprehensible in this class of work what does he call his pupil's attention to to all excess in form or thought that is to say to all that which at their age is essentially characteristic and individual their really independent traits which in response to this very premature excitation can manifest themselves only in awkwardness crudeness and grotesque features in short their individuality is reproved and rejected by the teacher in favour of an unoriginal decent average on the other hand uniform mediocrity gets peevish praise for as a rule it is just the class of work likely to bore the teacher thoroughly there may still be men who recognize the most absurd and most dangerous element of the public school curriculum in the whole farce of this german composition originality is demanded here but the only shape in which it can manifest itself is rejected and the formal education that the system takes for granted is attained to only by a very limited number of men who complete it at a ripe age here everybody without exception is regarded as gifted for literature and considered as capable of holding opinions concerning the most important questions and people whereas the one aim which proper education should most zealously strive to achieve would be the suppression of all ridiculous claims to independent judgment and the inculcation upon young men of obedience to the sceptre of genius here a pompous form of diction is taught in an age when every spoken or written word is a piece of barbarism now let us consider besides the danger of arousing the self-complacency which is so easily awakened in youths let us think how their vanity must be flattered when they see their literary reflection for the first time in the mirror who having seen all these effects at one glance could any longer doubt whether all the faults of our public literary and artistic life were not stamped upon every fresh generation by the system we are examining hasty and vain production the disgraceful manufacture of books complete want of style the crude characterless or sadly swaggering method of expression the loss of every aesthetic canon the voluptuousness of anarchy and chaos in short the literary peculiarities of both our journalism and our scholarship none but the very fewest are aware that among many thousands perhaps only one is justified in describing himself as literary and that all others who at their own risk try to be so deserve to be met with homeric laughter by all competent men as a reward for every sentence they have ever had printed for it is truly a spectacle meet for the gods to see a literary hephaestus limping forward who would pretend to help us to something to educate men to earnest and inexorable habits and views in this respect should be the highest aim of all mental training whereas the general laissez aller of the fine personality can be nothing else than the hallmark of barbarism from what i have said however it must be clear that at least in the teaching of german no thought is given to culture something quite different is in view namely the production of the aforementioned free personality and so long as german public schools prepare the road for outrageous and irresponsible scribbling so long as they do not regard the immediate and practical discipline of speaking and writing as their most holy duty 
so long as they treat the mother tongue as if it were only a necessary evil or a dead body i shall not regard these institutions as belonging to real culture in regard to the language what is surely least noticeable is any trace of the influence of classical examples that is why on the strength of this consideration alone the so-called classical education which is supposed to be provided by our public school strikes me as something exceedingly doubtful and confused for how could anybody after having cast one glance at those examples fail to see the great earnestness with which the greek and the roman regarded and treated his language from his youth onwards how is it possible to mistake one's example on a point like this one provided of course that the classical hellenic and roman world really did hover before the educational plan of our public schools is the highest and most instructive of all morals a fact i feel very much inclined to doubt the claim put forward by public schools concerning the classical education they provide seems to be more an awkward evasion than anything else it is used whenever there is any question raised as to the competency of the public schools to impart culture and to educate classical education indeed it sounds so dignified it confounds the aggressor and staves off the assault for who could see to the bottom of this bewildering formula all at once and this has long been the customary strategy of the public school from whichever side the war cry may come it writes upon its shield not overloaded with honours one of those confusing catchwords such as classical education formal education scientific education three glorious things which are however unhappily at loggerheads not only with themselves but among themselves and are such that if they were compulsorily brought together would perforce bring forth a culture monster for a classical education is something so unheard of difficult and rare and exact such complicated talent that only ingenuousness or impudence could put it forward as an attainable goal in our public schools the words formal education belong to that crude kind of unphilosophical phraseology which one should do one's utmost to get rid of for there is no such thing as the opposite of formal education and he who regards scientific education as the object of a public school thereby sacrifices classical education and the so-called formal education at one stroke as the scientific man and the cultured man belong to two different spheres which though coming together at times in the same individual are never reconciled if we compare all three of these would-be aims of the public school with the actual facts to be observed in the present method of teaching german we see immediately what they really amount to in practice that is to say only two subterfuges for use in the fight and struggle for existence and often enough mere means wherewith to bewilder an opponent for we are unable to detect any single feature in this teaching of german which in any way recalls the example of classical antiquity and its glorious methods of training in languages formal education however which is supposed to be achieved by this method of teaching german has been shown to be wholly at the pleasure of the free personality which is as good as saying that it is barbarism and anarchy and as for the preparation in science which is one of the consequences of this teaching our germanists will have to determine in all justice how little these learned beginnings in public schools have contributed to the splendour of their sciences and how much the personality of individual university professors has done so put briefly the public school has hitherto neglected its most important and most urgent duty towards the very beginning of all real culture which is the mother tongue but in so doing it has lacked the natural fertile soil for all further efforts at culture for only by means of stern artistic and careful discipline and habit in a language can the correct feeling for the greatness of our classical writers be strengthened up to the present their recognition by the public schools has been owing almost solely to the doubtful aesthetic hobbies of a few teachers or to the massive effects 
of certain of their tragedies and novels but everybody should himself be aware of the difficulties of the language he should have learnt them from experience after long seeking and struggling he must reach the path our great poets trod in order to be able to realise how lightly and beautifully they trod it and how stiffly and swaggeringly the others follow at their heels only by means of such discipline can the young man acquire that physical loathing for the beloved and much admired elegance of style of our newspaper manufacturers and novelists and for the ornate style of our literary men by it alone is he irrevocably elevated at a stroke above a whole host of absurd questions and scruples such for instance as whether our bach and gutzkow are really poets for his disgust at both will be so great that he will be unable to read them any longer and thus the problem will be solved for him let no one imagine that it is an easy matter to develop this feeling to the extent necessary in order to have this physical loathing but let no one hope to reach sound aesthetic judgments along any other road than the thorny one of language and by this i do not mean philological research but self-discipline in one's mother tongue everybody who is in earnest in this matter will have the same sort of experience as the recruit in the army who is compelled to learn walking after having walked almost all his life as a dilettante or empiricist it is a hard time one almost fears that the tendons are going to snap and one ceases to hope that the artificial and consciously acquired movements and positions of the feet will ever be carried out with ease and comfort it is painful to see how awkwardly and heavily one foot is set before the other and one dreads that one may not only be unable to learn the new way of walking but that one will forget how to walk at all then it suddenly become noticeable that a new habit and a second nature have been born of the practised movements and that the assurance and strength of the old manner of walking returns with a little more grace at this point one begins to realise how difficult walking is and one feels in a position to laugh at the untrained empiricist or the elegant dilettante our elegant writers as their style shows have never learnt walking in this sense in our public schools as our other writers show no one learns walking either culture begins however with the correct movement of the language and once it has properly begun it begets that physical sensation in the presence of elegant writers which is known by the name of loathing we recognize the fatal consequences of our present public schools in that they are unable to inculcate severe and genuine culture which should consist above all in obedience and habituation and that at their best they much more often achieve a result by stimulating and kindling scientific tendencies is shown by the hand which is so frequently seen uniting scholarship and barbarous taste science and journalism in a very large majority of cases to-day we can observe how sadly our scholars fall short of the standard of culture which the efforts of goethe schiller lessing and winkelmann established and this falling short shows itself precisely in the egregious errors which the men we speak of are exposed to equally among literary historians whether gervinus or julian schmidt as in any other company everywhere indeed where men and women converse it shows itself most frequently and painfully however in pedagogic spheres in the literature of public schools it can be proved that the only value that these men have in a real educational establishment has not been mentioned much less generally recognized for half a century their value as preparatory leaders and mystagogues of classical culture guided by whose hands alone can the correct road leading to antiquity be found every so-called classical education can have but one natural starting point an artistic earnest and exact familiarity with the use of the mother tongue this together with the secret of form however one can seldom attain to of one's own accord almost everybody requires those great leaders and tutors and must place himself in their hands there is however no such thing 
as a classical education that could grow without this inferred love of form here where the power of discerning form and barbarity gradually awakens there appear the pinions which bear one to the only real home of culture ancient greece if with the solitary help of those pinions we sought to reach those far distant and diamond-studded walls encircling the stronghold of hellenism we should certainly not get very far once more therefore we need the same leaders and tutors our german classical writers that we may be borne up to by the wing strokes of their past endeavours to the land of yearning to greece not a suspicion of this possible relationship between our classics and classical education seems to have pierced the antique walls of public schools philologists seem much more eagerly engaged in introducing homer and sophocles to the young souls of their pupils in their own style calling the results simply by the unchallenged euphemism classical education let every one's own experience tell him what he had of homer and sophocles at the hands of such eager teachers it is in this department that the greatest number of deepest deceptions occur and whence misunderstandings are inadvertently spread in german public schools i have never yet found a trace of what might really be called classical education and there is nothing surprising in this when one thinks of the way in which these institutions have emancipated themselves from german classical writers and the discipline of the german language nobody reaches antiquity by means of a leap into the dark and yet the whole method of treating ancient writers in schools the plain commentating and paraphrasing of our philological teachers amounts to nothing more than a leap into the dark the feeling for classical hellenism is a matter of fact such an exceptional outcome of the most energetic fight for culture and artistic talent that the public schools could only have professed to awaken this feeling owing to a very crude misunderstanding in what age in an age which is led about blindly by the most sensational desires of the day and which is not aware of the fact that once that feeling for hellenism is roused it immediately becomes aggressive and must express itself by indulging in an incessant war with the so-called culture of the present for the public school boy of to-day the hellenes as hellenes are dead yes he gets some enjoyment out of homer but a novel by spielhagen interests him much more yes he swallows greek tragedy and comedy with a certain relish but a thoroughly modern drama like freitag's journalists moves him in quite another fashion in regard to all ancient authors he is rather inclined to speak after the manner of the aesthete hermann grimm who on one occasion at the end of a torturous essay on the venus of milo asks himself what does this goddess's form mean to me of what use are the thoughts she suggests to me orestes and oedipus iphigenia and antigone what have they in common with my heart no my dear public schoolboy the venus of milo does not concern you in any way and concerns your teacher just as little and that is the misfortune that is the secret of the modern public school who will conduct you to the land of culture if your leaders are blind and assume the position of seers notwithstanding which of you will ever attain to a true feeling for the sacred seriousness of art if you are systematically spoiled and taught to stutter independently instead of being taught to speak to esthetize on your own account when you ought to be taught to approach works of art almost piously to philosophize without assistance while you ought to be compelled to listen to great thinkers all this with the result that you remain eternally at a distance from antiquity and become the servants of the day at all events the most wholesome feature of our modern institutions is to be found in the earnestness with which the latin and greek languages are studied over a long course of years in this way boys learn to respect a grammar lexicons and a language that conforms to fixed rules in this department of public school work there is an exact knowledge of what constitutes a fault and no one is troubled with any thought of justifying himself every minute by appealing as in the case of modern german to various grammatical and orthographical vagaries and vicious forms if only this respect for language did not hang in the air so like a theoretical burden which one is pleased to throw off the moment one turns to one's mother tongue 
more often than not the classical master makes pretty short work of the mother tongue from the outset he treats it as a department of knowledge in which one is allowed that indolent ease with which the german treats everything that belongs to his native soil the splendid practice afforded by translating from one language into another which so improves and fertilizes one's artistic feeling for one's own tongue is in the case of german never conducted with that fitting categorical strictness and dignity which would be above all necessary in dealing with an undisciplined language of late exercises of this kind have tended to decrease ever more and more people are satisfied to know the foreign classical tongues they would scorn being able to apply them here one gets another glimpse of the scholarly tendency of public schools a phenomenon which throws much light upon the object which once animated them that is to say the serious desire to cultivate the pupil this belonged to the time of our great poets those few really cultured germans the time when the magnificent friedrich august wolf directed the new stream of classical thought introduced from greece and rome by those men into the heart of the public schools thanks to his bold start a new order of public schools was established which thenceforward was not to be merely a nursery for science but above all the actual consecrated home of all higher and nobler culture of the many necessary measures which this change called into being some of the most important have been transferred with lasting success to the modern regulations of public schools the most important of all however did not succeed the one demanding that the teacher also should be consecrated to the new spirit so that the aim of the public school has meanwhile considerably departed from the original plan laid down by wolf which was the cultivation of the pupil the old estimate of scholarship and scholarly culture as an absolute which wolf overcame seems after a slow and spiritless struggle rather to have taken the place of the culture principle of more recent introduction and now claims its former exclusive rights though not with the same frankness but disguised and with features veiled and the reason why it was impossible to make public schools fall in with the magnificent plan of classical culture lay in the un-german almost foreign or cosmopolitan nature of these efforts in the cause of education and the belief that it was possible to remove the native soil from under a man's feet and that he should still remain standing in the illusion that people can spring direct without bridges into the strange hellenic world by abjuring german and the german mind in general of course one must know how to trace this germanic spirit to its lair beneath its many modern dressings or even beneath heaps of ruins one must love it so that one is not ashamed of it in its stunted form and one must above all be on one's guard against confounding it with what now disports itself proudly as up-to-date german culture the german spirit is very far from being on friendly terms with this up-to-date culture and precisely in those spheres where the latter complains of a lack of culture the real german spirit has survived though perhaps not always with a graceful but more often an ungraceful exterior on the other hand that which now grandiloquently assumes the title of german culture is a sort of cosmopolitan aggregate which bears the same relation to the german spirit as journalism does to schiller or meyerbeer to beethoven here the strongest influence at work is the fundamentally and thoroughly un-german civilization of france which is aped neither with talent nor with taste and the imitation of which gives the society the press the art and the literary style of germany their pharisaical character naturally the copy nowhere produces the really artistic effect which the original grown out of the heart of roman civilization is able to produce almost to this day in france let any one who wishes to see the full force of this contrast compare our most noted novelists with the less noted ones of france or italy he will recognize in both the same doubtful tendencies and aims as also the same still more doubtful means but in france he will find them coupled with artistic earnestness at least with grammatical purity and often with beauty while in their very feature he will recognize the echo of a corresponding social culture in germany on the other hand they will strike him as unoriginal flabby filled with dressing-gown thoughts and expressions unpleasantly spread out 
and therewithal possessing no background of social form at the most owing to their scholarly mannerisms and display of knowledge he will be reminded of the fact that in latin countries it is the artistically trained man and that in germany it is the abortive scholar who becomes a journalist with this would be german and thoroughly unoriginal culture the german can nowhere reckon upon victory the frenchman and the italian will always get the better of him in this respect while in regard to the clever imitation of a foreign culture the russian above all will always be his superior we are therefore all the more anxious to hold fast to that german spirit which revealed itself in the german reformation and in german music in which has shown its enduring and genuine strength and the enormous courage and severity of german philosophy and in the loyalty of the german soldier which has been tested quite recently from it we expect a victory over that up-to-date pseudo-culture which is now the fashion what we should hope for the future is that schools may draw the real school of culture into this struggle and kindle the flame of enthusiasm in the younger generation more particularly in public schools for that which is truly german and in this way so-called classical education will resume its natural place and recover its one possible starting point a thorough reformation and purification of the public school can only be the outcome of a profound and powerful reformation and purification of the german spirit it is a very complex and difficult task to find the border line which joins the heart of the germanic spirit with the genius of greece not however before the noblest needs of genuine german genius snatch at the hand of this genius of greece as at a firm post in the torrent of barbarity not before a devouring yearning for this genius of greece takes possession of german genius and not before that view of the greek home on which schiller and goethe after enormous exertions were able to feast their eyes has become the mecca of the best and most gifted men will the aim of classical education in public schools acquire any definition and they at least will not be to blame who teach ever so little science and learning in public schools in order to keep a definite and at the same time ideal aim in their eyes and to rescue their pupils from that glistening phantom which now allows itself to be called culture and education this is the sad plight of the public schools of to-day the narrowest views remain in a certain measure right because no one seems able to reach or at least to indicate the spot where all these views culminate in error no one the philosopher's pupil inquired with a slight quaver in his voice and both men were silent End of section five section six of the complete works of friedrich nietzsche volume three this librivox recording is in the public domain third lecture delivered on the twenty seventh of february eighteen seventy two ladies and gentlemen at the close of my last lecture the conversation to which i was a listener and the outlines of which as i clearly recollect them i am now trying to lay before you was interrupted by a long and solemn pause both the philosopher and his companion sat silent sunk in deep dejection the peculiarly critical state of that important educational institution the german public school lay upon their souls like a heavy burden which one single well-meaning individual is not strong enough to remove and the multitude though strong not well-meaning enough our solitary thinkers were perturbed by two facts by clearly perceiving on the one hand that what might rightly be called classical education was now only a far-off ideal a castle in the air which could not possibly be built as a reality on the foundations of our present educational system and that on the other hand what was now with customary and unopposed euphemism pointed to as classical education could only claim the value of a pretentious illusion the best effect of which 
was that the expression classical education still lived on and had not yet lost its pathetic sound these two worthy men saw clearly by the system of instruction in vogue that the time was not yet ripe for a higher culture a culture founded upon that of the ancients the neglected state of linguistic instruction the forcing of students into learned historical paths instead of giving them a practical training the connection of certain practices encouraged in the public schools with the objectionable spirit of our journalistic publicity all these easily perceptible phenomena of the teaching of german led to the painful certainty that the most beneficial of those forces which have come down to us from classical antiquity are not yet known in our public schools forces which would train students for the struggle against the barbarism of the present age and which will perhaps once more transform the public schools into the arsenals and workshops of this struggle on the other hand it would seem in the meantime as if the spirit of antiquity in its fundamental principles had already been driven away from the portals of the public schools and as if here also the gates were thrown open as widely as possible to the bee flattered and pampered type of our present self-styled german culture and if the solitary talkers caught a glimpse of a single ray of hope it was that things have to become still worse that what was as yet divined only by the few would soon be clearly perceived by the many and that then the time for honest and resolute men for the earnest consideration of the scope of the education of the masses would not be far distant after a few minutes silent reflection the philosopher's companion turned to him and said you used to hold out hopes to me but now you have done more you have widened my intelligence and with it my strength and courage now indeed can i look on the field of battle with more hardihood now indeed do i repent of my too hasty flight we want nothing for ourselves and it should be nothing to us how many individuals may fall in this battle or whether we ourselves may be among the first just because we take this matter so seriously we should not take our own poor selves so seriously at the very moment we are falling some one else will grasp the banner of our faith i will not even consider whether i am strong enough for such a fight whether i can offer sufficient resistance it may even be an honourable death to fall to the accompaniment of the mocking laughter of such enemies whose seriousness has frequently seemed to us to be something ridiculous when i think how my contemporaries prepared themselves for the highest posts in the scholastic profession as i myself have done then i know how we often laughed at the exact contrary and grew serious over something quite different now my friend interrupted the philosopher laughingly you speak as one who would fain dive into the water without being able to swim and who fears something even more than the mere drowning not being drowned but laughed at but being laughed at should be the very last thing for us to dread for we are in a sphere where there are too many truths to tell too many formidable painful unpardonable truths for us to escape hatred and only fury here and there will give rise to some sort of embarrassed laughter just think of the innumerable crowd of teachers who in all good faith have assimilated the system of education which has prevailed up to the present that they may cheerfully and without overmuch deliberation carry it further on what do you think it will seem like to these men when they hear of projects from which 
they are excluded beneficio naturae of commands which their mediocre abilities are totally unable to carry out of hopes which find no echo in them of battles the war cries of which they do not understand and in the fighting of which they can take part only as dull and obtuse rank and file but without exaggeration that must necessarily be the position of practically all the teachers in our higher educational establishments and indeed we cannot wonder at this when we consider how such a teacher originates how he becomes a teacher of such high status such a large number of higher educational establishments are now to be found everywhere that far more teachers will continue to be required for them than the nature of even a highly gifted people can produce and thus an inordinate stream of undesirables flows into these institutions who however by their preponderating numbers and their instinct of similis simile gaudet gradually come to determine the nature of these institutions there may be a few people hopelessly unfamiliar with pedagogical matters who believe that our present profusion of public schools and teachers which is manifestly out of all proportion can be changed into a real profusion an ubertus ingenii merely by a few rules and regulations and without any reduction in the number of these institutions but we may surely be unanimous in recognizing that by the very nature of things only an exceedingly small number of people are destined for a true course of education and that a much smaller number of higher educational establishments would suffice for their further development but that in view of the present large numbers of educational institutions those for whom in general such institutions ought only to be established must feel themselves to be the least facilitated in their progress the same holds good in regard to teachers it is precisely the best teachers those who generally speaking judged by a high standard are worthy of this honourable name who are now perhaps the least fitted in view of the present standing of our public schools for the education of these unselected youths huddled together in a confused heap but who must rather to a certain extent keep hidden from them the best they could give and on the other hand by far the larger number of these teachers feel themselves quite at home in these institutions as their moderate abilities stand in a kind of harmonious relationship to the dullness of their pupils it is from this majority that we hear the ever resounding call for the establishment of new public schools and higher educational institutions we are living in an age which by ringing the changes on its deafening and continual cry would certainly give one the impression that there was an unprecedented thirst for culture which eagerly sought to be quenched but it is just at this point that one should learn to hear aright it is here without being disconcerted by the thundering noise of the education mongers that we must confront those who talk so tirelessly about the educational necessities of their time then we should meet with a strange disillusionment one which we my good friend have often met with those blatant heralds of educational needs when examined at close quarters are suddenly seen to be transformed into zealous yea fanatical opponents of true culture that is all those who hold fast to the aristocratic nature of the mind for at bottom they regard as their goal the emancipation of the masses from the mastery of the great few they seek to overthrow the most sacred hierarchy in the kingdom of the intellect the servitude of the masses their submissive obedience their instinct of loyalty to the rule of genius i have long accustomed myself to look with caution 
upon those who are ardent in the cause of the so-called education of the people in the common meaning of the phrase since for the most part they desire for themselves consciously or unconsciously absolutely unlimited freedom which must inevitably degenerate into something resembling the saturnalia of barbaric times and which the sacred hierarchy of nature will never grant them they were born to serve and to obey and every moment in which their limping or crawling or broken-winded thoughts or at work shows us clearly out of which clay nature moulded them and what trademark she branded thereon the education of the masses cannot therefore be our aim but rather the education of a few picked men for great and lasting works we well know that a just posterity judges the collective intellectual state of a time only by those few great and lonely figures of the period and gives its decision in accordance with the manner in which they are recognized encouraged and honored or on the other hand in which they are snubbed elbowed aside and kept down what is called the education of the masses cannot be accomplished except with difficulty and even if a system of universal compulsory education be applied they can only be reached outwardly those individual lower levels where generally speaking the masses come into contact with culture where the people nourishes its religious instinct where it poetizes its mythological images where it keeps up its faith in its customs privileges native soil and language all these levels can scarcely be reached by direct means and in any case only by violent demolition and in serious matters of this kind to hasten forward the progress of the education of the people means simply the postponement of this violent demolition and the maintenance of that wholesome unconsciousness that sound sleep of the people without which counteraction and remedy no culture with the exhausting strain and excitement of its own actions can make any headway we know however what the aspiration is of those who would disturb the healthy slumber of the people and continually call out to them keep your eyes open be sensible be wise we know the aim of those who profess to satisfy excessive educational requirements by means of an extraordinary increase in the number of educational institutions and the conceited tribe of teachers originated thereby these very people using these very means are fighting against the natural hierarchy in the realm of the intellect and destroying the roots of all those noble and sublime plastic forces which have their material origin in the unconsciousness of the people and which fittingly terminate in the procreation of genius and its due guidance and proper training it is only in the simile of the mother that we can grasp the meaning and the responsibility of the true education of the people in respect to genius its real origin is not to be found in such education it has so to speak only a metaphysical source a metaphysical home but for the genius to make his appearance for him to emerge from among the people to portray the reflected picture as it were the dazzling brilliancy of the peculiar colours of this people to depict the noble destiny of a people in the similitude of an individual in a work which will last for all time thereby making his nation itself eternal and redeeming it from the ever-shifting element of transient things all this is possible for the genius only when he has been brought up and come to maturity in the tender care of the culture of a people whilst on the other hand without this sheltering home the genius will not generally speaking be able to rise to the height of his eternal flight but will at an early moment like a stranger whether driven upon a bleak snow-covered desert slink away from the inhospitable land you astonish me with such metaphysics of genius said the teacher's companion and i've only a hazy conception of the accuracy of your similitude on the other hand i fully understand what you have said about the surplus of public schools 
and the corresponding surplus of higher grade teachers and in this regard i myself have collected some information which assures me that the educational tendency of the public school must right itself by this very surplus of teachers who have really nothing at all to do with education and who are called into existence and pursue this path solely because there is a demand for them every man who in an, an unexpected moment of enlightenment has convinced himself of the singularity and inaccessibility of hellenic antiquity and has warded off this conviction after an exhausting struggle every such man knows that the door leading to this enlightenment will never remain open to all comers and he deems it absurd yea disgraceful to use the greeks as he would any other tool he employs when following his profession or earning his living shamelessly fumbling with coarse hands amidst the relics of these holy men this brazen and vulgar feeling is however most common in the profession from which the largest numbers of teachers for the public schools are drawn the philological profession wherefore the reproduction and continuation of such a feeling in the public school will not surprise us just look at the younger generation of philologists how seldom we see in them that humble feeling that we when compared with such a world as it was have no right to exist at all how coolly and fearlessly as compared with us did that young blood build its miserable nests in the midst of the magnificent temples a powerful voice from every nook and cranny should ring in the ears of those who from the day they begin their connection with the university roam at will with such self-complacency and shamelessness among the awe-inspiring relics of that noble civilization hence ye uninitiated who will never be initiated fly away in silence and shame from these sacred chambers but this voice speaks in vain for one must to some extent be a greek to understand a greek curse of excommunication but these people i am speaking of are so barbaric that they dispose of these relics to suit themselves all their modern conveniences and fancies are brought with them and concealed among those ancient pillars and tombstones and he gives rise to great rejoicing when somebody finds among the dust and cobwebs of antiquity something that he himself had slyly hidden there not so very long before one of them makes verses and takes care to consult hesychius lexicon something there immediately assures him that he is destined to be an imitator of aeschylus and leads him to believe indeed that he has something in common with aeschylus the miserable poetaster yet another peers with the suspicious eye of a policeman into every contradiction even into the shadow of every contradiction of which homer was guilty he fritters away his life in tearing homeric rags to tatters and sewing them together again rags that he himself was the first to filch from the poet's kingly robe a third feels ill at ease when examining all the mysterious and orgiastic sides of antiquity he makes up his mind once and for all to let the enlightened apollo alone pass without dispute and to see in the athenian a gay and intelligent but nevertheless somewhat immoral apollonian what a deep breath he draws when he succeeds in raising yet another dark corner of antiquity to the level of his own intelligence when for example he discovers in pythagoras a colleague who is as enthusiastic as himself in arguing about politics another racks his brains as to why oedipus was condemned by fate to perform such abominable deeds killing his father marrying his mother where lies the blame where the poetic justice suddenly it occurs to him oedipus was a passionate fellow lacking all christian gentleness he even fell into an unbecoming rage when tiresias called him a monster and the curse of the whole country be humble and meek was what sophocles tried to teach otherwise you will have to marry your mothers and kill your fathers others again passed their lives in counting number of verses written by greek and roman poets and are delighted with the proportions seven to thirteen equals fourteen to twenty-six 
finally one of them brings forward his solution of a question such as the homeric poems considered from the standpoint of prepositions and thinks he has drawn the truth from the bottom of the well with anna and kata all of them however with the most widely separated aims in view dig and burrow in greek soil with a restlessness and a blundering awkwardness that must surely be painful to a true friend of antiquity and thus it comes to pass that i should like to take by the hand every talented or talentless man who feels a certain professional inclination urging him on to the study of antiquity and harangue him as follows young sir do you know what perils threaten you with your little stock of school learning before you become a man in the full sense of the word have you heard that according to aristotle it is by no means a tragic death to be slain by a statue does that surprise you know then that for centuries philologists have been trying with ever-failing strength to re-erect the fallen statue of greek antiquity but without success for it is a colossus around which single individual men crawl like pygmies the leverage of the united representatives of modern culture is utilized for the purpose but it invariably happens that the huge column is scarcely more than lifted from the ground when it falls down again crushing beneath its weight the luckless whites underneath it that however may be tolerated for every being must perish by some means or other but who is there to guarantee that during all these attempts the statue itself will not break in pieces the philologists are being crushed by the greeks perhaps we can put up with this but antiquity itself threatens to be crushed by these philologists think that over you easy-going young man and turn back lest you too should not be an iconoclast indeed said the philosopher laughing there are many philologists who have turned back as you so much desire and i notice a great contrast with my own youthful experience consciously or unconsciously large numbers of them have concluded that it is hopeless and useless for them to come into direct contact with classical antiquity hence they are inclined to look upon this study as barren superseded out of date this herd has turned with much greater zest to the science of language here in this wide expanse of virgin soil where even the most mediocre gifts can be turned to account and where a kind of insipidity and dullness is even looked upon as decided talent with the novelty and uncertainty of methods and the constant danger of making fantastic mistakes here where dull regimental routine and discipline are desiderata here the newcomer is no longer frightened by the majestic and warning voice that rises from the ruins of antiquity here every one is welcomed with open arms including even him who never arrived at any uncommon impression or noteworthy thought after a perusal of sophocles and aristophanes with the result that they end in an etymological tangle or are seduced into collecting the fragments of out-of-the-way dialects and their time is spent in associating and dissociating collecting and scattering and running hither and thither consulting books and such a usefully employed philologist would now feign to be a teacher he now undertakes to teach the youth of the public schools something about the ancient writers although he himself has read them without any particular impression much less with insight what a dilemma antiquity has said nothing to him consequently he has nothing to say about antiquity a sudden thought strikes him why is he a skilled philologist at all why did these authors write latin and greek and with a light heart he immediately begins to etymologize with homer calling lithuanian or ecclesiastical slavonic or above all the sacred sanskrit to his assistance as if greek lessons were merely the excuse for a general introduction to the study of languages and as if homer were lacking in only one respect namely not being written in pre-indo-germanic whoever is acquainted with our present public schools well knows what a wide gulf separates their teachers from classicism and how from a feeling of this want comparative philology and allied professions have increased their numbers to such an unheard-of degree what i mean is said the other it would depend upon whether a teacher of classical culture did not confuse his greeks and romans with the other peoples the barbarians whether he could never put greek and latin 
on a level with other languages so far as his classicalism is concerned it is a matter of indifference whether the framework of these languages concurs with or is in any way related to the other languages such a concurrence does not interest him at all his real concern is with what is not common to both with what shows him that those two peoples were not barbarians as compared with the others in so far of course as he is a true teacher of culture and models himself after the majestic patterns of the classics i may be wrong said the philosopher but i suspect that owing to the way in which latin and greek are now taught in schools the accurate grasp of these languages the ability to speak and write them with ease is lost and that is something in which my own generation distinguished itself a generation indeed whose few survivors have by this time grown old whilst on the other hand the present teachers seem to impress their pupils with the genetic and historical importance of this subject to such an extent that at best their scholars ultimately turn into little sanskritists etymological spitfires or reckless conjecturers but not one of them can read his plato or tacitus with pleasure as we old folk can the public schools may still be seats of learning not however of the learning which as it were is only the natural and involuntary auxiliary of a culture that is directed towards the noblest ends but rather of that culture which might be compared to the hypertrophical swelling of an unhealthy body the public schools are certainly the seats of this obesity if indeed they have not degenerated into the abodes of that elegant barbarism which is boasted of as being german culture of the present but asked the other what is to become of that large body of teachers who have not been endowed with a true gift for culture and who set up as teachers merely to gain a livelihood from the profession because there is a demand for them because a superfluity of schools brings with it a superfluity of teachers where shall they go when antiquity peremptorily orders them to withdraw must they not be sacrificed to those powers of the present who day after day call out to them from the never-ending columns of the press we are culture we are education we are at the zenith we are the apexes of the pyramids we are the aims of universal history when they hear the seductive promises when the shameful signs of non-culture the plebeian publicity of the so-called interests of culture are extolled for their benefit in magazines and newspapers as an entirely new and the best possible full-grown form of culture whither shall the poor fellows fly when they feel the presentiment that these promises are not true we are but to the most obtuse sterile scientificality that here the shriek of culture may no longer be audible to them pursued in this way must they not end like the ostrich by burying their heads in the sand is it not a real happiness for them buried as they are among dialects etymologies and conjectures to lead a life like that of the ants even though they are miles removed from true culture if only they can close their ears tightly and be deaf to the voice of the elegant culture of the time you are right my friend said the philosopher but whence comes the urgent necessity for a surplus of schools for culture which further gives rise to the necessity for a surplus of teachers when we so clearly see that the demand for a surplus springs from a sphere which is hostile to culture and that the consequences of this surplus only lead to non-culture indeed we can discuss this dire necessity only in so far as the modern state is willing to discuss these things with us and is prepared to follow up its demands by force which phenomenon certainly makes same impression upon most people as if they were addressed by the eternal law of things for the rest a culture state to use the current expression which makes such demands is rather a novelty and has only come to a self-understanding within the last half-century that is in a period when to use the favourite popular word so many self-understood things came into being but which are in themselves not self-understood at all this right to higher education has been taken so seriously by the most powerful of modern states prussia that the objectionable principle it has adopted taken in connection with the well-known daring and hardihood of this state 
is seen to have a menacing and dangerous consequence for the true german spirit for we see endeavours being made in this quarter to raise the public school formally systematized up to the so-called level of the time here is to be found all that mechanism by means of which as many scholars as possible are urged on to take up courses of public school training here indeed the state has its most powerful inducement the concession of certain privileges respecting military service with the natural consequence that according to the unprejudiced evidence of statistical officials by this and by this only can we explain the universal congestion of all prussian public schools and the urgent and continual need for new ones what more can the state do for a surplus of educational institutions than bring all the higher and the majority of the lower civil service appointments the right of entry to the universities and even the most influential military posts into close connection with the public school and all this in a country where both universal military service and the highest offices of the state unconsciously attract all gifted natures to them the public school is here looked upon as an honourable aim and every one who feels himself urged on to the sphere of government will be found on his way to it this is a new and quite original occurrence the state assumes the attitude of a mystagogue of culture and whilst it promotes its own ends it obliges every one of its servants not to appear in its presence without the torch of universal state education in their hands by the flickering light of which they may again recognize the state as the highest goal as the reward of all their strivings after education now this last phenomenon should indeed surprise them it should remind them of that allied slowly understood tendency of a philosophy which was formally promoted for reasons of state namely the tendency of the hegelian philosophy yea it would perhaps be no exaggeration to say that in the subordination of all strivings after education to reasons of state prussia has appropriated with success the principle and the useful heirloom of the hegelian philosophy whose apotheosis of the state in this subordination certainly reaches its height but said the philosopher's companion what purpose can the state have in view with such a strange aim for that it has some state objects in view is seen in the manner in which the conditions of prussian schools are admired by meditated upon and occasionally imitated by other states these other states obviously presuppose something here that if adopted would tend towards the maintenance and power of the state like our well-known and popular conscription where every one proudly wears his soldier's uniform at regular intervals where almost every one has absorbed a uniform type of national culture through the public schools enthusiastic hyperboles may well be uttered concerning the systems employed in former times and a form of state omnipotence which was attained only in antiquity and which almost every young man by both instinct and training thinks it is the crowning glory and highest aim of human beings to reach such a comparison said the philosopher would be quite hyperbolical and would not hobble along on one leg only for indeed the ancient state emphatically did not share the utilitarian point of view of recognizing as culture only what was directly useful to the state itself and was far from wishing to destroy those impulses which did not seem to be immediately applicable for this very reason the profound greek had for the state that strong feeling of admiration and thankfulness which is so distasteful to modern men because he clearly recognized not only that without such state protection the germs of his culture could not develop but also that all his inimitable and perennial culture had flourished so luxuriantly under the wise and careful guardianship of the protection afforded by the state the state was for his culture not a supervisor regulator and watchman but a vigorous and muscular companion and friend ready for war 
who accompanied his noble admired and as it were ethereal friend through disagreeable reality earning his thanks therefore this however does not happen when a modern state lays claim to such hearty gratitude because it renders such chivalrous service to german culture and art for in this regard its past is as ignominious as its present as a proof of which we have but to think of the manner in which the memory of our great poets and artists is celebrated in german cities and how the highest objects of these german masters are supported on the part of the state there must therefore be peculiar circumstances surrounding both this purpose towards which the state is tending and which always promotes what is here called education and surrounding likewise the culture thus promoted which subordinates itself to this purpose of the state with the real german spirit and the education derived therefrom such as i have slowly outlined for you this purpose of the state is at war hiddenly or openly the spirit of education which is welcomed and encouraged with such interest by the state and owing to which the schools of this country are so much admired abroad must accordingly originate in a sphere that never comes into contact with this true german spirit with that spirit which speaks to us so wondrously from the inner heart of the german reformation german music and german philosophy and which like a noble exile is regarded with such indifference and scorn by the luxurious education afforded by the state this spirit is a stranger it passes by in solitary sadness and far away from it the censor of pseudo-culture is swung backwards and forwards which amidst the acclamations of educated teachers and journalists arrogates to itself its name and privileges and meets out insulting treatment to the word german why does the state require that surplus of educational institutions of teachers why this education of the masses on such an extended scale because the true german spirit is hated because the aristocratic nature of true culture is feared because the people endeavour in this way to drive single great individuals into self-exile so that the claims of the masses to education may be so to speak planted down and carefully tended in order that the many may in this way endeavour to escape the rigid and strict discipline of the few great leaders so that the masses may be persuaded that they can easily find the path for themselves following the guiding star of the state a new phenomenon the state as the guiding star of culture in the meantime one thing consoles me this german spirit which people are combating so much and for which they have substituted a gaudily attired locum tenens this spirit is brave it will fight and redeem itself into a purer age noble as it is now and victorious as it one day will be it will always preserve in its mind a certain pitiful toleration of the state if the latter hard pressed in the hour of extremity secures such a pseudo culture as its associate for what after all do we know about the difficult task of governing men that is to keep law order quietness and peace among millions of boundlessly egoistical unjust unreasonable dishonourable envious malignant and hence very narrow-minded and perverse human beings and thus to protect the few things that the state has conquered for itself against covetous neighbours and jealous robbers such a hard-pressed state holds out its arms to any associate grasps at any straw and when such an associate does introduce himself with flowery eloquence when he adjudges the state as hegel did to be an absolutely complete ethical organism the be-all and end-all of every one's education and goes on to indicate how he himself can best promote the interests of the state who will be surprised if without further parley the state falls upon his neck and cries aloud in a barbaric voice of full conviction yes thou art education thou art indeed culture End of section six section seven of the complete works of friedrich nietzsche volume three 
this librivox recording is in the public domain fourth lecture delivered on the fifth of march eighteen seventy two ladies and gentlemen now that you have followed my tale up to this point and that we have made ourselves joint masters of the solitary remote and at times abusive duologue of the philosopher and his companion i sincerely hope that you like strong swimmers are ready to proceed on the second half of our journey especially as i can promise you that a few other marionettes will appear in the puppet play of my adventure and that if up to the present you have only been able to do little more than endure what i have been telling you the waves of my story will now bear you more quickly and easily towards the end in other words we have now come to a turning and it would be advisable for us to take a short glance backwards to see what we think we have gained from such a varied conversation remain in your present position the philosopher seemed to say to his companion for you may cherish hopes it is more and more clearly evident that we have no educational institutions at all but that we ought to have them our public schools established it would seem for this high object have either become the nurseries of a reprehensible culture which repels the true culture with profound hatred that is a true aristocratic culture founded upon a few carefully chosen minds or they foster a micrological and sterile learning which while it is far removed from culture has at least this merit that it avoids that reprehensible culture as well as the true culture the philosopher had particularly drawn his companion's attention to the strange corruption which must have entered into the heart of culture when the state thought itself capable of tyrannizing over it and of attaining its ends through it and further when the state in conjunction with this culture struggled against other hostile forces as well as against the spirit which the philosopher ventured to call the true german spirit this spirit linked to the greeks by the noblest ties and shown by its past history to have been steadfast and courageous pure and lofty in its aims its faculties qualifying it for the high task of freeing modern man from the curse of modernity this spirit is condemned to live apart banished from its inheritance but when its slow painful tones of woe resound through the desert of the present then the overladen and gaily decked caravan of culture is pulled up short horror-stricken we must not only astonish but terrify such was the philosopher's opinion not to fly shamefully away but to take the offensive was his advice but he especially counselled his companion not to ponder too anxiously over the individual from whom through a higher instinct this aversion for the present barbarism proceeded let it perish the pythian god had no difficulty in finding a new tripod a second pythia so long at least as the mystic cold vapours rose from the earth the philosopher once more began to speak be careful to remember my friend said he there are two things you must not confuse a man must learn a great deal that he may live and take part in the struggle for existence but everything that he as an individual learns and does with this end in view has nothing whatever to do with culture this latter only takes its beginning in a sphere that lies far above the world of necessity indigence and struggle for existence the question now is to what extent a man values his ego in comparison with other egos how much of his strength he uses up in the endeavour to earn his living many a one by stoically confining his needs within a narrow compass will shortly and easily reach the sphere in which he may forget and as it were shake off his ego so that he can enjoy perpetual youth in a solar system of timeless and impersonal things another widens the scope and needs of his ego as much as possible and builds the mausoleum of this ego in vast proportions as if he were prepared to fight and conquer that terrible adversary time in this instinct also we may see a longing for immortality wealth and power wisdom presence of mind eloquence 
a flourishing outward aspect a renowned name all these are merely turned into the means by which an insatiable personal will to live craves for new life with which again it hankers after an eternity that is at last seen to be illusory but even in this highest form of the ego in the enhanced needs of such a distended and as it were collective individual true culture is never touched upon and if for example art is sought after only its disseminating and stimulating actions come into prominence that is those which least give rise to pure and noble art and most of all to low and degraded forms of it for in all his efforts however great and exceptional they seem to the onlooker he never succeeds in freeing himself from his own hankering and restless personality that illuminated ethereal sphere where one may contemplate without the obstruction of one's own personality continually recedes from him and thus let him learn travel and collect as he may he must always live an exiled life at a remote distance from a higher life and from true culture for a true culture would scorn to contaminate itself with the needy and covetous individual it well knows how to give the slip to the man who would fain employ it as a means of attaining to egoistic ends and if any one cherishes the belief that he has firmly secured it as a means of livelihood and that he can procure the necessities of life by its sedulous cultivation then it suddenly steals away with noiseless steps and an air of derisive mockery i will thus ask you my friend not to confound this culture this sensitive fastidious ethereal goddess with that useful maid of all work which is also called culture but which is only the intellectual servant and counsellor of one's practical necessities wants and means of livelihood every kind of training however which holds out the prospect of breadwinning as its end and aim is not a training for culture as we understand the word but merely a collection of precepts and directions to show how in the struggle for existence a man may preserve and protect his own person it may be freely admitted that for the great majority of men such a course of instruction is of the highest importance and the more arduous the struggle is the more intensely must the young man strain every nerve to utilize his strength to the best advantage but let no one think for a moment that the schools which urge him on to the struggle and prepare him for it are in any way seriously to be considered as establishments of culture they are institutions which teach one how to take part in the battle of life whether they promise to turn out civil servants or merchants or officers or wholesale dealers or farmers or physicians or men with a technical training the regulations and standards prevailing as such institutions differ from those in a true educational institution and what in the latter is permitted and even freely held out as often as possible ought to be considered as a criminal offence in the former let me give you an example if you wish to guide a young man on the path of true culture beware of interrupting his naive confident and as it were immediate and personal relationship with nature the woods the rocks the winds the vulture the flowers the butterfly the meads the mountain slopes must all speak to him in their own language in them he must as it were come to know himself again in countless reflections and images and a variegated round of changing visions and in this way he will unconsciously and gradually feel the metaphysical unity of all things in the great image of nature and at the same time tranquillize his soul in the contemplation of her eternal endurance and necessity but how many young men should be permitted to grow up in such close and almost personal proximity to nature the others must learn another truth betimes how to subdue nature to themselves here is an end of this naive metaphysics and the physiology of plants and animals geology and organic chemistry force their devotees to view nature from an altogether different standpoint what is lost by this new point of view is not only a poetical phantasmagoria but the instinctive true and unique point of view instead of which we have 
shrewd and clever calculations and so to speak overreachings of nature thus to the truly cultured man is vouchsafed the inestimable benefit of being able to remain faithful without a break to the contemplative instincts of his childhood and so to attain to a calmness unity consistency and harmony which can never be even thought of by a man who is compelled to fight in the struggle for existence you must not think however that i wish to withhold all praise from our primary and secondary schools i honour the seminaries where boys learn arithmetic and master modern languages and study geography and the marvellous discoveries made in natural science i am quite prepared to say further that those youths who pass through the better class of secondary schools are well entitled to make the claims put forward by the fully fledged public school boy and the time is certainly not far distant when such pupils will be everywhere freely admitted to the universities and positions under the government which has hitherto been the case only with scholars from the public schools of our present public schools be it noted i cannot however refrain from adding the melancholy reflection if it be true that secondary and public schools are on the whole working so heartily in common towards the same ends and differ from each other only in such a slight degree that they may take equal rank before the tribunal of the state then we completely lack another kind of educational institutions those for the development of culture to say the least the secondary schools cannot be reproached with this for they have up to the present propitiously and honourably followed up tendencies of a lower order but one nevertheless highly necessary in the public schools however there is very much less honesty and very much less ability too for in them we find an instinctive feeling of shame the unconscious perception of the fact that the whole institution has been ignominiously degraded and that the sonorous words of wise and apathetic teachers are contradictory to the dreary barbaric and sterile reality so there are no true cultural institutions and in those very places where a pretence to culture is still kept up we find the people more hopeless atrophied and discontented than in the secondary schools where the so-called realistic subjects are taught besides this only think how immature and uninformed one must be in the company of such teachers when one actually misunderstands the rigorously defined philosophical expressions real and realism to such a degree as to think them the contraries of mind and matter and to interpret realism as the road to knowledge formation and master of reality i for my own part know of only two exact contraries institutions for teaching culture and institutions for teaching how to succeed in life all our present institutions belong to the second class but i am speaking only of the first about two hours went by while the philosophically minded couple chatted about such startling questions night slowly fell in the meantime and when in the twilight the philosopher's voice had sounded like natural music through the woods it now rang out in the profound darkness of the night when he was speaking with excitement or even passionately his tones hissing and thundering far down the valley and reverberating among the trees and rocks suddenly he was silent he had just repeated almost pathetically the words we have no true educational institutions we have no true educational institutions when something fell down just in front of him it might have been a fir cone and his dog barked and ran towards it thus interrupted the philosopher raised his head and suddenly became aware of the darkness the cool air and the lonely situation of himself and his companion well what are we about he ejaculated it's dark you know whom we were expecting here but he hasn't come we have waited in vain let us go i must now ladies and gentlemen convey to you the impressions experienced by my friend and myself as we eagerly listened to this conversation which we heard distinctly in our hiding-place i have already told you that at that place and at that hour we had intended to hold a festival in commemoration of something and this something had to do with nothing else than 
matters concerning educational training of which we in our own youthful opinions had garnered a plentiful harvest during our past life we were thus disposed to remember with gratitude the institution which we had at one time thought out for ourselves at that very spot in order as i have already mentioned that we might reciprocally encourage and watch over one another's educational impulses but a sudden and unexpected light was thrown on all that past life as we silently gave ourselves up to the vehement words of the philosopher as when a traveller walking heedlessly across unknown ground suddenly puts his foot over the edge of a cliff so it now seemed to us that we had hastened to meet the great danger rather than run away from it here at this spot so memorable to us we heard the warning back not another step know you not whither your footsteps tend whither this deceitful path is luring you it seemed to us that we now knew and our feeling of overflowing thankfulness impelled us so irresistibly towards our earnest counsellor and trusty eckhart that both of us sprang up at the same moment and rushed towards the philosopher to embrace him he was just about to move off and had already turned sideways when we rushed up to him the dog turned sharply round and barked thinking doubtless like the philosopher's companion of an attempt at robbery rather than an enraptured embrace it was plain that he had forgotten us in a word he ran away our embrace was a miserable failure when we did overtake him for my friend gave a loud yell as the dog bit him and the philosopher himself sprang away from me with such force that we both fell well with the dog and the men there was a scramble that lasted a few minutes until my friend began to call out loudly parodying the philosopher's own words in the name of all culture and pseudo-culture what does the silly dog want with us hence you confounded dog you uninitiated never to be initiated hasten away from us silent and ashamed after this outburst matters were cleared up to some extent at any rate so far as they could be cleared up in the darkness of the wood oh it's you ejaculated the philosopher our duelists how you startled us what on earth drives you to jump out upon us like this at such a time of the night joy thankfulness and reverence said we shaking the old man by the hand whilst the dog barked as if he understood we can't let you go without telling you this and if you are to understand everything you must not go away just yet we want to ask you about so many things that lie heavily on our hearts stay yet a while we know every foot of the way and can accompany you afterwards the gentleman you expect may yet turn up look over yonder on the rhine what is that we see so clearly floating on the surface of the water as if surrounded by the light of many torches it is there that we may look for your friend i would even venture to say that it is he who is coming towards you with all those lights and so much did we assail the surprised old man with our entreaties promises and fantastic delusions that we persuaded the philosopher to walk to and fro with us on the little plateau by learned lumber undisturbed as my friend added shame on you said the philosopher if you really want to quote something why choose faust however i will give in to you quotation or no quotation if only our young companions will keep still and not run away as suddenly as they made their appearance for they are like will-o'-the-wisp we are amazed when they are there and again when they are not there my friend immediately recited respect i hope will teach us how we may our lighter disposition keep at bay our course is only zigzag as a rule the philosopher was surprised and stood still you astonish me you will o the wisp he said this is no quagma we are on now of what use is this ground to you what does the proximity of a philosopher mean to you for around him the air is sharp and clear the ground dry and hard you must find out a more fantastic region for your zigzagging inclinations i think interrupted the philosopher's companion at this point the gentlemen have already told us that they promised to meet some one here at this hour but it seems to me that they listen to our comedy of education like a chorus and truly idealistic spectators for they did not disturb us we thought we were alone with each other 
yes that is true said the philosopher that praise must not be withheld from them but it seems to me that they deserve still higher praise here i seized the philosopher's hand and said that man must be as obtuse as a reptile with his stomach on the ground and his head buried in mud who can listen to such a discourse as yours without becoming earnest and thoughtful or even excited and indignant self-accusation and annoyance might perhaps cause a few to get angry but our impression was quite different the only thing i do not know is how exactly to describe it this hour was so well timed for us and our minds were so well prepared that we sat there like empty vessels and now it seems as if we were filled to overflowing with this new wisdom for i no longer know how to help myself and if some one asks me what i am thinking of doing to-morrow or what i have made up my mind to do with myself from now on i should not know what to answer for it is easy to see that we have up to the present been living and educating ourselves in the wrong way but what can we do to cross over the chasm between to-day and to-morrow yes acknowledged my friend i have a similar feeling and i ask the same question but besides that i feel as if i were frightened away from german culture by entertaining such high and ideal views of its task yea as if i were unworthy to cooperate with it in carrying out its aims I only see a resplendent file of the highest natures moving towards this goal i can imagine over what abysses and through what temptations this procession travels who would dare to be so bold as to join in it at this point the philosopher's companion again turned to him and said don't be angry with me when i tell you that i too have a somewhat similar feeling which i have not mentioned to you before when talking to you i often felt drawn out of myself as it were and inspired with your ardour and hopes till i almost forgot myself then a calmer moment arrives a piercing wind of reality brings me back to earth and then i see the wide gulf between us over which you yourself as in a dream draw me back again then what you call culture merely totters meaninglessly round round me or lies heavily on my breast it is like a shirt of mail that weighs me down or a sword that i cannot wield our minds as we thus argued with the philosopher were unanimous and mutually encouraging and stimulating one another we slowly walked with him backwards and forwards along the unencumbered space which had earlier in the day served us as a shooting range and then in the still night under the peaceful light of hundreds of stars we all broke out into a tirade which ran somewhat as follows you have told us so much about the genius we began about his lonely and wearisome journey through the world as if nature never exhibited anything but the most diametrical contraries in one place the stupid dull masses acting by instinct and then on a far higher and more remote plane the great contemplating few destined for the production of immortal works but now you call these the apexes of the intellectual pyramid it would however seem that between the broad heavily burdened foundation up to the highest of the free and unencumbered peaks there must be countless intermediate degrees and that here we must apply the saying natura non facit saltus where then are we to look for the beginning of what you call culture where is the line of demarcation to be drawn between the spheres which are ruled from below upwards and those which are ruled from above downwards and if it be only in connection with these exalted beings that true culture may be spoken of how are institutions to be founded for the uncertain existence of such natures how can we devise educational establishments which shall be of benefit only to these select few it rather seems to us that such persons know how to find their own way and that their full strength is shown in their being able to walk without the educational crutches necessary for other people and thus undisturbed to make their way through the storm and stress of this rough world just like a phantom we kept on arguing in this fashion speaking without any great ability and not putting our thoughts in any special form but the philosopher's companion went even further and said to him just think of all these great geniuses of whom we are wont to be so proud looking upon them as tried and true leaders and guides of this real german spirit 
whose names we commemorate by statues and festivals and whose works we hold up with feelings of pride for the admiration of foreign lands how did they obtain the education you demand for them to what degree do they show that they have been nourished and matured by basking in the sun of national education and yet they are seen to be possible they have nevertheless become men whom we must honour yea their works themselves justify the form of the development of these noble spirits they justify even a certain want of education for which we must make allowance owing to their country and the age in which they live how could lessing and winkelmann benefit by the german culture of their time even less than or at all events just as little as beethoven schiller goethe or every one of our great poets and artists it may perhaps be a law of nature that only the later generations are destined to know by what divine gifts an earlier generation was favoured at this point the old philosopher could not control his anger and shouted to his companion o oh, you innocent lamb of knowledge you gentle sucking doves all of you and would you give the name of arguments to those distorted clumsy narrow-minded ungainly crippled things yes i've just now been listening to the fruits of some of this present-day culture and my ears are still ringing with the sound of historical self-understood things of overwise and pitiless historical reasonings mark this thou unprofaned nature thou hast grown old and for thousands of years this starry sky has spanned the space above thee but thou hast never yet heard such conceited and at bottom mischievous chatter as the talk of the present day so you are proud of your poets and artists my good teutons you point to them and brag about them to foreign countries do you and because as has given you no trouble to have them amongst you you have formed the pleasant theory that you need not concern yourselves further with them isn't that so my inexperienced children they come of their own free will the stork brings them to you who would dare to mention a midwife you deserve an earnest teaching eh you should be proud of the fact that all the noble and brilliant men we have mentioned are prematurely suffocated worn out and crushed through you through your barbarism you think without shame of lessing who on account of your stupidity perished in battle against your ludicrous gods and idols the evils of your theatres your learned men and your theologians without once daring to lift himself to the height of that immortal flight for which he was brought into the world and what are your impressions when you think of winkelmann who that he might rid his eyes of your grotesque fatuousness went to beg help from the jesuits and whose disgraceful religious conversion recoils upon you and will always remain an ineffaceable blemish upon you you can even name schiller without blushing just look at his picture the fiery sparkling eyes looking at you with disdain those flushed death-like cheeks can you learn nothing from all that in him you had a beautiful and divine plaything and through it was destroyed and if it had been possible for you to take goethe's friendship away from this melancholy hasty life hunted to premature death then you would have crushed him even sooner than you did you have not rendered assistance to a single one of our great geniuses and now upon that fact you wish to build up the theory that none of them shall ever be helped in future for each of them however up to this very moment you have always been the resistance of the stupid world that goethe speaks of in his epilogue to the bell towards each of them you acted the part of apathetic dullards or jealous narrow hearts or malignant egotists in spite of you they created their immortal works against you they directed their attacks and thanks to you they died so prematurely their tasks only half accomplished blunted and dulled and shattered in the battle who can tell to what these heroic men were destined to attain if only that true german spirit had gathered them together within the protecting walls of a powerful institution that spirit which without the help of some such institution drags out an isolated debased and degraded existence all those great men were utterly ruined and it is only an insane belief in the hegelian reasonableness of all happenings which would absolve you of any responsibility in the matter 
and not those men alone indictments are pouring forth against you from every intellectual province whether i look at the talents of our poets philosophers painters or sculptors and not only in the case of gifts of the highest order i everywhere see immaturity overstrained nerves or prematurely exhausted energies abilities wasted and nipped in the bud i everywhere feel that resistance of the stupid world in other words your guiltiness that is what i am talking about when i speak of lacking educational establishments and why i think those which at present claim the name in such a pitiful condition whoever is pleased to call this an ideal desire and refers to it as ideal as if he were trying to get rid of it by praising me deserves the answer that the present system is a scandal and a disgrace and that the man who asks for warmth in the midst of ice and snow must indeed get angry if he hears this referred to as an ideal desire the matter we are now discussing is concerned with clear urgent and palpably evident realities a man who knows anything of the question feels that there is a need which must be seen to just like cold and hunger but the man who is not affected at all by this matter most certainly has a standard by which to measure the extent of his own culture and thus to know what i call culture and where the line should be drawn between that which is ruled from below upwards and that which is ruled from above downwards the philosophers seemed to be speaking very heatedly we begged him to walk round with us again since he had uttered the latter part of his discourse standing near the tree stump which had served us as a target for a few minutes not a word more was spoken slowly and thoughtfully we walked to and fro we did not so much feel ashamed of having brought forward such foolish arguments as we felt a kind of restitution of our personality after the heated and so far as we were concerned very unflattering utterance of the philosopher we seemed to feel ourselves nearer to him that we even stood in a personal relationship to him for so wretched is man that he never feels himself brought into such close contact with a stranger as when the latter shows some sign of weakness some defect that our philosopher had lost his temper and made use of abusive language helped to bridge over the gulf created between us by our timid respect for him and for the sake of the reader who feels his indignation rising at this suggestion let it be added that this bridge often leads from distant hero worship to personal love and pity and after the feeling that our personality had been restored to us this pity gradually became stronger and stronger why were we making this old man walk up and down with us between the rocks and trees at that time of the night and since he had yielded to our entreaties why could we not have thought of a more modest an unassuming manner of having ourselves instructed why should the three of us have contradicted him in such clumsy terms for now we saw how thoughtless unprepared and baseless were all the objections we had made and how greatly the echo of the present was heard in them the voice of which in the province of culture the old man would fain not have heard our objections however were not purely intellectual ones our reasons for protesting against the philosopher's statements seemed to lie elsewhere they arose perhaps from the instinctive anxiety to know whether if the philosopher's views were carried into effect our own personalities would find a place in the higher or lower division and this made it necessary for us to find some arguments against the mode of thinking which robbed us of our self-styled claims to culture people however should not argue with companions who feel the weight of an argument so personally or as the moral in our case would have been such companions should not argue should not contradict at all so we walked on beside the philosopher ashamed compassionate dissatisfied with ourselves and more than ever convinced that the old man was right and that we had done him wrong how remote now seemed the youthful dream of our educational institution how clearly we saw the danger which we had hitherto escaped merely by good luck namely giving ourselves up body and soul to the educational system which forced itself upon our notice so enticingly from the time when we entered the public schools up to that moment how then had it come about that we had not taken our places in the chorus of its admirers 
perhaps merely because we were real students and could still draw back from the rough and tumble the pushing and struggling the restless ever-breaking waves of publicity to seek refuge in our own little educational establishment which however time would have soon swallowed up also overcome by such reflections we were about to address the philosopher again when he suddenly turned towards us and said in a softer tone i cannot be surprised if you young men behave rashly and thoughtlessly for it is hardly likely that you have ever seriously considered what i have just said to you don't be in a hurry carry this question about with you but do at any rate consider it day and night for you are now at the parting of the ways and now you know where each path leads if you take the one your age will receive you with open arms you will not find it wanting in honours and decorations you will form units of an enormous rank and file and there will be as many people like-minded standing behind you as in front of you and when the leader gives the word it will be re-echoed from rank to rank for here your first duty is this to fight in rank and file and your second to annihilate all those who refuse to form part of the rank and file on the other path you will have but few fellow-travellers it is more arduous winding and precipitous and those who take the first path will mock you for your progress is more wearisome and they will try to lure you over into their own ranks when the two paths happen to cross however you will be roughly handled and thrust aside or else shunned and isolated now take these two parties so different from each other in every respect and tell me what meaning an educational establishment would have for them that enormous horde crowding onwards on the first path towards its goal would take the turn to mean an institution by which each of its members would become duly qualified to take his place in the rank and file and would be purged of everything which might tend to make him strive after higher and more remote aims i don't deny of course that they can find pompous words with which to describe their aims for example they speak of the universal development of free personality upon a firm social national and human basis or they announce as their goal the founding of the peaceful sovereignty of the people upon reason education and justice an educational establishment for the other and smaller company however would be something vastly different they would employ it to prevent themselves from being separated from one another and overwhelmed by the first huge crowd to prevent their few select spirits from losing sight of their splendid and noble task through premature weariness or from being turned aside from the true path corrupted or subverted these select spirits must complete their work that is the raison d'etre of their common institution a work indeed which as it were must be free from subjective traces and must further rise above the transient events of future times as the pure reflection of the eternal and immutable essence of things and all those who occupy places in that institution must cooperate in the endeavour to engender men of genius by this purification from subjectiveness and the creation of the works of genius not a few even of those whose talents may be of the second or third order are suited to such cooperation and only when serving in such an educational establishment as this do they feel that they are truly carrying out their life's task but now it is just these talents i speak of which are drawn away from the true path and their instincts estranged by the continual seductions of that modern culture the egotistic emotions weaknesses and vanities of these few select minds are continually assailed by the temptations unceasingly murmured into their ears by the spirit of the age come with me there you are servants retainers tools eclipsed by higher natures your own peculiar characteristics never have free play you are tied down chained down like slaves yea like automata here with me you will enjoy the freedom of your own personalities as masters should your talents will cast their lustre on yourselves alone with their aid you may come to the very front rank an innumerable train of followers will accompany you and the applause of public opinion will yield you more pleasure than a nobly bestowed commendation from the height of genius even the very best of men 
now yield to these temptations and it cannot be said that the deciding factor here is the degree of talent or whether a man is accessible to these voices or not but rather the degree and the height of a certain moral sublimity the instinct towards heroism towards sacrifice and finally a positive habitual need of culture prepared by a proper kind of education which education as i have previously said is first and foremost obedience and submission to the discipline of genius of this discipline and submission however the present institutions called by courtesy educational establishments know nothing whatever although i have no doubt that the public school was originally intended to be an institution for sowing the seeds of true culture or at least as a preparation for it i have no doubt either that they took the first bold steps in the wonderful and stirring times of the reformation and that afterwards in the era which gave birth to schiller and goethe there was again a growing demand for culture like the first protuberance of that wing spoken of by plato in the phaedrus which at every contact with the beautiful bears the soul aloft into the upper regions the habitations of the gods ah began the philosopher's companion when you quote the divine plato in the world of ideas i do not think you are angry with me however much my previous utterance may have merited your disapproval and wrath as soon as you speak of it i feel that platonic wing rising within me and it is only at intervals when i act as the charioteer of my soul that i have any difficulty with the resisting and unwilling horse that plato has also described to us the crooked lumbering animal put together anyhow with a short thick neck flat-faced and of a dark colour with grey eyes and blood-red complexion the mate of insolence and pride shag-eared and deaf hardly yielding to whip or spur just think how long i have lived at a distance from you and how all those temptations you speak of have endeavoured to lure me away not perhaps without some success even though i myself may not have observed it i now see more clearly than ever the necessity for an institution which will enable us to live and mix freely with the few men of true culture so that we may have them as our leaders and guiding stars how greatly i feel the danger of travelling alone and when it occurred to me that i could save myself by flight from all contact with the spirit of the time i found that this flight itself was a mere delusion continuously with every breath we take some amount of that atmosphere circulates through every vein and artery and no solitude is lonesome or distant enough for us to be out of reach of its fogs and clouds whether in the guise of hope doubt profit or virtue the shades of that culture hover about us and we have been deceived by that jugglery even here in the presence of a true hermit of culture how steadfastly and faithfully must the few followers of that culture which might almost be called sectarian be ever on the alert how they must strengthen and uphold one another how adversely would any errors be criticised here and how sympathetically excused and thus teacher i ask you to pardon me after you have laboured so earnestly to set me in the right path you use a language which i do not care for my friend said the philosopher and one which reminds me of a diocesan conference with that i have nothing to do but your platonic horse pleases me and on its account you shall be forgiven i am willing to exchange my own animal for yours but it is getting chilly and i don't feel inclined to walk about any more just now the friend i was waiting for is indeed foolish enough to come up here even at midnight if he promised to do so but i have waited in vain for the signal agreed upon and i cannot guess what has delayed him for as a rule he is punctual as we old men are wont to be something that you young men nowadays look upon as old-fashioned but he has left me in the lurch for once how annoying it is come away with me it's time to go at this moment something happened End of section seven section eight of the complete works of friedrich nietzsche volume three 
this librivox recording is in the public domain fifth lecture delivered on the twenty third of march eighteen seventy two ladies and gentlemen if you have lent a sympathetic ear to what i have told you about the heated argument of our philosopher and the stillness of that memorable night you must have felt as disappointed as we did when he announced his peevish intention you will remember that he had suddenly told us he wished to go for having been left in the lurch by his friend in the first place and in the second having been bored rather than animated by the remarks addressed to him by his companion and ourselves when walking backwards and forwards on the hillside he now apparently wanted to put an end to what appeared to him to be a useless discussion it must have seemed to him that his day had been lost and he would have liked to blot it out of his memory together with the recollection of ever having made our acquaintance and we were thus rather unwillingly preparing to depart when something else suddenly brought him to a standstill and the foot he had just raised sank hesitatingly to the ground again a coloured flame making a crackling noise for a few seconds attracted our attention from the direction of the rhine and immediately following upon this we heard a slow harmonious call quite in tune although plainly the cry of numerous youthful voices that's his signal exclaimed the philosopher so my friend is really coming and i haven't waited for nothing after all it will be a midnight meeting indeed but how am i to let him know that i am still here come your pistols let us see your talent once again did you hear the severe rhythm of that melody saluting us mark it well and answer it in the same rhythm by a series of shots this was a task well suited to our tastes and abilities so we loaded up as quickly as we could and pointed our weapons at the brilliant stars in the heavens whilst the echo of that piercing cry died away in the distance the reports of the first second and third shots sounded sharply in the stillness and then the philosopher cried false time as our rhythm was suddenly interrupted for like a lightning flash a shooting star tore its way across the clouds after the third report and almost involuntarily our fourth and fifth shots were sent after it in the direction it had taken false time said the philosopher again who told you to shoot stars they can fall well enough without you people should know what they want before they begin to handle weapons and then we once more heard that loud melody from the waters of the rhine intoned by numerous and strong voices they understand us said the philosopher laughing and who indeed could resist when such a dazzling phantom comes within range hush interrupted his friend what sort of a company can it be that returns the signal to us in such a way i should say they were between twenty and forty strong manly voices in that crowd and where would such a number come from to greet us they don't appear to have left the opposite bank of the rhine yet but at any rate we must have a look at them from our own side of the river come along quickly we were then standing near the top of the hill you may remember and our view of the river was interrupted by a dark thick wood on the other hand as i have told you from the quiet little spot which we had left we could have a better view than from the little plateau on the hillside and the rhine with the island of nunnenwerth in the middle was just visible to the beholder who peered over the tree-tops we therefore set off hastily towards this little spot taking care however not to go too quickly for the philosopher's comfort the night was pitch dark 
and we seem to find our way by instinct rather than by clearly distinguishing the path as we walk down with the philosopher in the middle we had scarcely reached our side of the river when a broad and fiery yet dull and uncertain light shot up which plainly came from the opposite side of the rhine those are torches i cried there is nothing sure than that my comrades from bonn are over yonder and that your friend must be with them it is they who sang that peculiar song and they have doubtless accompanied your friend here see listen they are putting off in little boats the whole torchlight procession will have arrived here in less than half an hour the philosopher jumped back what do you say he ejaculated your comrades from bonn students can my friend have come here with students this question uttered almost wrathfully provoked us what's your objection to students we demanded but there was no answer it was only after a pause that the philosopher slowly began to speak not addressing us directly as it were but rather someone in the distance so my friend even at midnight even on the top of a lonely mountain we shall not be alone and you yourself are bringing a pack of mischief-making students along with you although you well know that i am only too glad to get out of the way of hoc genus omne i don't quite understand you my friend it must mean something when we arrange to meet after a long separation at such an out-of-the-way place and at such an unusual hour why should we want a crowd of witnesses and such witnesses what calls us together to-day is least of all a sentimental soft-hearted necessity for both of us learnt early in life to live alone in dignified isolation it was not for our own sakes not to show our tender feelings towards each other or to perform an unrehearsed act of friendship that we decided to meet here but that here where i once came suddenly upon you as you sat in majestic solitude we might earnestly deliberate with each other like knights of a new order let them listen to us who can understand us but why should you bring with you a throng of people who don't understand us i don't know what you mean by such a thing my friend we did not think it proper to interrupt the dissatisfied old grumbler and as he came to a melancholy close we did not dare to tell him how greatly this distrustful repudiation of students vexed us at last the philosopher's companion turned to him and said i am reminded of the fact that even you at one time before i made your acquaintance occupied posts in several universities and that reports concerning your intercourse with the students and your methods of instruction at the time are still in circulation from the tone of resignation in which you have just referred to students many would be inclined to think that you had some peculiar experiences which were not at all to your liking but personally i rather believe that you saw and experienced in such places just what every one else saw and experienced in them but that you judged what you saw and felt more justly and severely than any one else for during the time i have known you i have learnt that the most noteworthy instructive and decisive experiences and events in one's life are those which are of daily occurrence that the greatest riddle displayed in full view of all is seen by the fewest to be the greatest riddle and that these problems are spread about in every direction under the very feet of the passers-by for the few real philosophers to lift up carefully thenceforth to shine as diamonds of wisdom perhaps in the short time now left us before the arrival of your friend you would be good enough to tell us something of your experiences of university life so as to close the circle of the observations to which we were involuntarily urged respecting our educational institutions we may also be allowed to remind you that you at an earlier stage of your remarks gave me the promise that you would do so starting with the public school you claim for it an extraordinary importance 
all other institutions must be judged by its standard according as its aim has been proposed and if its aim happens to be wrong all the others have to suffer such an importance cannot now be adopted by the universities as a standard for by their present system of grouping they would be nothing more than institutions where public school students might go through finishing courses you promised me that you would explain this in greater detail later on perhaps our student friends can bear witness to that if they chance to overhear that part of our conversation we can testify to that i put in the philosopher then turned to us and said well if you really did listen attentively perhaps you can now tell me what you understand by the expression the present aim of our public schools besides you are still near enough to this sphere to judge my opinions by the standard of your own impressions and experiences my friend instantly answered quickly and smartly as was his habit in the following words until now we had always thought that the sole object of the public school was to prepare students for the universities this preparation however should tend to make us independent enough for the extraordinarily free position of a university student for it seems to me that a student to a greater extent than any other individual has more to decide and settle for himself he must guide himself on a wide utterly unknown path for many years so the public school must do its best to render him independent i continued the argument where my friend left off it even seems to me i said that everything for which you have justly blamed the public school is only a necessary means employed to imbue the youthful student with some kind of independence or at all events with the belief that there is such a thing the teaching of german composition must be at the service of this independence the individual must enjoy his opinions and carry out his designs early so that he may be able to travel alone and without crutches in this way he will soon be encouraged to produce original work and still sooner to take up criticism and analysis if latin and greek studies prove insufficient to make a student an enthusiastic admirer of antiquity the methods with which such studies are pursued are at all events sufficient to awaken the scientific sense the desire for a more strict causality of knowledge the passion for finding out and inventing only think how many young men may be lured away forever to the attractions of science by a new reading of some sort which they have snatched up with youthful hands at the public school the public school boy must learn and collect a great deal of varied information hence an impulse will gradually be created accompanied with which he will continue to learn and collect independently at the university we believe in short that the aim of the public school is to prepare and accustom the student always to live and learn independently afterwards just as beforehand he must live and learn dependently at the public school the philosopher laughed not altogether good-naturedly and said you have just given me a fine example of that independence and it is this very independence that shocks me so much and makes any place in the neighbourhood of present-day students so disagreeable to me yes my good friends you are perfect you are mature nature has cast you and broken up the moulds and your teachers must surely gloat over you what liberty certitude and independence of judgment what novelty and freshness of insight you sit in judgment and the cultures of all ages run away the scientific sense is kindled and rises out of you like a flame let people be careful lest you set them alight if i go further into the question and look at your professors i again find the same independence in a greater and even more charming degree never was there a time so full of the most sublime independent folk never was slavery more detested the slavery of education and culture included permit me however to measure this independence of yours by the standard of this culture and to consider your university as an educational institution and nothing else 
if a foreigner desires to know something of the methods of our universities he asks first of all with emphasis how is the student connected with the university we answer by the ear as a hearer the foreigner is astonished only by the ear he repeats only by the ear we again reply the student hears when he speaks when he sees when he is in the company of his companions when he takes up some branch of art in short when he lives he is independent that is not dependent upon the educational institution the student very often writes down something while he hears and it is only at these rare moments that he hangs to the umbilical cord of his alma mater he himself may choose what he is to listen to he is not bound to believe what is said he may close his ears if he does not care to hear this is the acromatic method of teaching the teacher however speaks to these listening students whatever else he may think and do is cut off from the student's perception by an immense gap the professor often reads when he is speaking as a rule he wishes to have as many hearers as possible he is not content to have a few and he is never satisfied with one only one speaking mouth with many ears and half as many writing hands there you have to all appearances the external academical apparatus the university engine of culture set in motion moreover the proprietor of this one mouth is severed from and independent of the owners of the many ears and this double independence is enthusiastically designated as academical freedom and again that this freedom may be broadened still more the one may speak what he likes and the other may hear what he likes except that behind both of them at a modest distance stands the state with all the intentness of a supervisor to remind the professors and students from time to time that it is the aim the goal the be-all and end-all of this curious speaking and hearing procedure we who must be permitted to regard this phenomenon merely as an educational institution will then inform the inquiring foreigner that what is called culture in our universities merely proceeds from the mouth to the ear and that every kind of training for culture is as i said before merely acromatic since however not only the hearing but also the choice of what to hear is left to the independent decision of the liberal-minded and unprejudiced student and since again he can withhold all belief and authority from what he hears all training for culture in the true sense of the term reverts to himself and the independence it was thought desirable to aim at in the public school now presents itself with the highest possible pride as academical self-training for culture and struts about in its brilliant plumage happy times when youths are clever and cultured enough to teach themselves how to walk unsurpassable public schools which succeed in implanting independence in the place of dependence discipline subordination and obedience implanted by former generations that thought it their duty to drive away all the bumptiousness of independence do you clearly see my good friends why i from the standpoint of culture regard the present type of university as a mere appendage to the public school the culture instilled by the public school passes through the gates of the university as something ready and entire and with its own particular claims it demands it gives laws it sits in judgment do not then let yourselves be deceived in regard to the cultured student for he in so far as he thinks he has absorbed the blessings of education is merely the public school boy as moulded by the hands of his teacher one who senses academical isolation and after he has left the public school has therefore been deprived of all further guidance to culture that from now on he may begin to live by himself and be free free examine this freedom ye observers of human nature erected upon the sandy crumbling foundation of our present public school culture its building slants to one side trembling before the whirlwind's blast 
look at the free student the herald of self-culture guess what his instincts are explain him from his needs how does his culture appear to you when you measure it by three graduated scales first by his need for philosophy second by his instinct for art and third by greek and roman antiquity as the incarnate and categorical imperative of all culture man is so much encompassed about by the most serious and difficult problems that when they are brought to his attention in the right way he is impelled betimes towards a lasting kind of philosophical wonder from which alone as a fruitful soil a deep and noble culture can grow forth his own experiences lead him most frequently to the consideration of these problems and it is especially in the tempestuous period of youth that every personal event shines with a double gleam both as the exemplification of a triviality and at the same time of an eternally surprising problem deserving of explanation at this age which as it were sees his experiences encircled with metaphysical rainbows man is in the highest degree in need of a guiding hand because he is suddenly and almost instinctively convinced himself of the ambiguity of existence and has lost the firm support of the beliefs he has hitherto held this natural state of great need must of course be looked upon as the worst enemy of that beloved independence for which the cultured youth of the present day should be trained all these sons of the present who have raised the banner of the self-understood are therefore straining every nerve to crush down these feelings of youth to cripple them to mislead them or to stop their growth altogether and the favourite means employed is to paralyse that natural philosophic impulse by the so-called historical culture a still recent system which has won for itself a world-wide scandalous reputation has discovered the formula for this self-destruction of philosophy and now wherever the historical view of things is found we can see such a naive recklessness in bringing the irrational to rationality and reason and making black look like white that one is even inclined to parody hegel's phrase and ask is all this irrationality real ah it is only the irrational that now seems to be real that is really doing something and to bring this kind of reality forward for the elucidation of history is reckoned as true historical culture it is into this that the philosophical impulse of our time has pupated itself and the peculiar philosophers of our universities seem to have conspired to fortify and confirm the young academicians in it it has thus come to pass that in place of a profound interpretation of the eternally recurring problems a historical yea even philological balancing and questioning has entered into the educational arena what this or that philosopher has or has not thought whether this or that essay or dialogue is to be ascribed to him or not or even whether this particular reading of a classical text is to be preferred to that it is to neutral preoccupations with philosophy like these that our students in philosophical seminaries are stimulated whence i have long accustomed myself to regard such science as a mere ramification of philology and to value its representatives in proportion as they are good or bad philologists so it has come about that philosophy itself is banished from the universities wherewith our first question as to the value of our universities from the standpoint of culture is answered in what relationship these universities stand to art cannot be acknowledged without shame in none at all of artistic thinking learning striving and comparison we do not find in them a single trace and no one would seriously think that the voice of the universities would ever be raised to help the advancement of the higher national schemes of art whether an individual teacher feels himself to be personally qualified for art or whether a professorial chair has been established for the training of aestheticizing literary historians does not enter into the question at all the fact remains that the university is not 
in a position to control the young academician by severe artistic discipline and that it must let happen what happens willy-nilly and this is the cutting answer to the immodest pretensions of the universities to represent themselves as the highest educational institutions we find our academical independence growing up without philosophy and without art and how can they then have any need to go in for the greeks and romans for we need now no longer pretend like our forefathers to have any great regard for greece and rome which besides sit enthroned in almost inaccessible loneliness and majestic alienation the universities of the present time consequently give no heed to almost extinct educational predilections like these and found their philological chairs for the training of new and exclusive generations of philologists who on their part give similar philological preparation in the public schools a vicious circle which is useful neither to philologists nor to public schools but which above all accuses the university for the third time of not being what it so pompously proclaims itself to be a training ground for culture take away the greeks together with philosophy and art and what latter have you still remaining by which to ascend to culture for if you attempt to clamber up the ladder without these helps you must permit me to inform you that all your learning will lie like a heavy burden on your shoulders rather than furnishing you with wings and bearing you aloft if you honest thinkers have honourably remained in these three stages of intelligence and have perceived that in comparison with the greeks the modern student is unsuited to and unprepared for philosophy that he has no truly artistic instincts is merely a barbarian believing himself to be free you will not on this account turn away from him in disgust although you will of course avoid coming into too close proximity with him for as he now is he is not to blame as you have perceived him he is the dumb but terrible accuser of those who are to blame you should understand the secret language spoken by this guilty innocent and then you too would learn to understand the inward state of that independence which is paraded outwardly with so much ostentation not one of these noble well-qualified youths has remained a stranger to that restless tiring perplexing and debilitating need of culture during his university term when he is apparently the only free man in a crowd of servants and officials he atones for this huge illusion of freedom by ever-growing inner doubts and convictions he feels that he can neither lead nor help himself and then he plunges hopelessly into the workaday world and endeavours to ward off such feelings by study the most trivial bustle fastens itself upon him he sinks under his heavy burden then he suddenly pulls himself together he still feels some of that power within him which would have enabled him to keep his head above water pride and noble resolutions assert themselves and grow in him he is afraid of sinking at this early stage into the limits of a narrow profession and now he grasps at pillars and railings alongside the stream that he may not be swept away by the current in vain for these supports give way and he finds he has clutched at broken reeds in low and despondent spirits he sees his plans vanish away in smoke his condition is undignified even dreadful he keeps between the two extremes of work at high pressure and a state of melancholy enervation then he becomes tired lazy afraid of work fearful of everything great and hating himself he looks into his own breast analyzes his faculties and finds he is only peering into hollow and chaotic vacuity and then he once more falls from the heights of his eagerly desired self-knowledge into an ironical scepticism he divests his struggles of their real importance and feels himself ready to undertake any class of useful work however degrading he now seeks consolation in hasty and incessant action so as to hide himself from himself and thus his helplessness and the want of a leader towards culture drive him from one form of life into another 
but doubt elevation worry hope despair everything flings him hither and thither as a proof that all the stars above him by which he could have guided his ship have set there you have the picture of this glorious independence of yours of that academical freedom reflected in the highest minds those which are truly in need of culture compared with whom that other crowd of indifferent natures does not count at all natures that delight in their freedom in a purely barbaric sense for these latter show by their base smugness and their narrow professional limitations that this is the right element for them against which there is nothing to be said their comfort however does not counterbalance the suffering of one single young man who has an inclination for culture and feels the need of a guiding hand and who at last in a moment of discontent throws down the reins and begins to despise himself this is the guiltless innocent for who has saddled him with the unbearable burden of standing alone who has urged him on to independence at an age when one of the most natural and peremptory needs of youth is so to speak a self-surrendering to great leaders and an enthusiastic following in the footsteps of the masters it is repulsive to consider the effects to which the violent suppression of such noble natures may lead he who surveys the greatest supporters and friends of that pseudo-culture of the present time which i so greatly detest will only too frequently find among them such degenerate and shipwrecked men of culture driven by inward despair to violent enmity against culture when in a moment of desperation there was no one at hand to show them how to attain it it is not the worst and most insignificant people whom we afterwards find acting as journalists and writers for the press in the metamorphosis of despair the spirit of some well-known men of letters might even be described and justly as degenerate studentdom how else for example can we reconcile that once well-known young germany with its present degenerate successors here we discover a need of culture which so to speak has grown mutinous and which finally breaks out into the passionate cry i am culture there before the gates of the public schools and universities we can see the culture which has been driven like a fugitive away from these institutions true this culture is without the erudition of those establishments but assumes nevertheless the mien of a sovereign so that for example gutzkow the novelist might be pointed to as the best example of a modern public school boy turned aesthete such a degenerate man of culture is a serious matter and it is a horrifying spectacle for us to see that all our scholarly and journalistic publicity bears the stigma of this degeneracy upon it how else can we do justice to our learned men who pay untiring attention to and even cooperate in the journalistic corruption of the people how else than by the acknowledgment that their learning must fill a want of their own similar to that filled by novel writing in the case of others that is a flight from one's self an ascetic extirpation of their cultural impulses a desperate attempt to annihilate their own individuality from our degenerate literary art as also from that itch for scribbling of our learned men which has now reached such alarming proportions wells forth the same sigh oh that we could forget ourselves the attempt fails memory not yet suffocated by the mountains of printed paper under which it is buried keeps on repeating from time to time a degenerate man of culture born for culture and brought up to non-culture helpless barbarian slave of the day chained to the present moment and thirsting for us something ever thirsting oh the miserable guilty innocents for they lack something a need that every one of them must have felt a real educational institution which could give them goals masters methods companions and from the midst of which the invigorating and uplifting breath of the true german spirit would inspire them thus they perish in the wilderness thus they degenerate 
into enemies of that spirit which is at bottom closely allied to their own thus they pile fault upon fault higher than any former generation ever did soiling the clean desecrating the holy canonizing the false and spurious it is by them that you can judge the educational strength of our universities asking yourselves in all seriousness the question what cause did you promote through them the german power of invention the noble german desire for knowledge the qualifying of the german for diligence and self-sacrifice splendid and beautiful things which other nations envy you yea the finest and most magnificent things in the world if only that true german spirit overspread them like a dark thundercloud pregnant with the blessing of forthcoming rain but you are afraid of this spirit and it has therefore come to pass that a cloud of another sort has thrown a heavy and oppressive atmosphere around your universities in which your noble-minded scholars breathe wearily and with difficulty a tragic earnest and instructive attempt was made in the present century to destroy the cloud i have last referred to and also to turn the people's looks in the direction of the high welkin of the german spirit in all the annals of our universities we cannot find any trace of a second attempt and he who would impressively demonstrate what is now necessary for us will never find a better example i refer to the old primitive Birkenschaft. when the war of liberation was over the young student brought back home the unlooked-for and worthiest trophy of battle the freedom of his fatherland crowned with this laurel he thought of something still nobler on returning to the university and finding that he was breathing heavily he became conscious of that oppressive and contaminated air which overhung the culture of the university he suddenly saw with horror struck wide-open eyes the non-german barbarism hiding itself in the guise of all kinds of scholasticism he suddenly discovered that his own leaderless comrades were abandoned to a repulsive kind of youthful intoxication and he was exasperated he rose with the same aspect of proud indignation as schiller may have had when reciting the robbers to his companions and if he had prefaced his drama with the picture of a lion and the motto in tyrannos his follower himself was that very lion preparing to spring and every tyrant began to tremble yes if these indignant youths were looked at superficially and timorously they would seem to be little less than schiller's robbers their talk sounded so wild to the anxious listener that rome and sparta seemed mere nunneries compared with these new spirits the consternation raised by these young men was indeed far more general than had ever been caused by those other robbers in court circles of which a german prince according to goethe is said to have expressed the opinion if he had been god and had foreseen the appearance of the robbers he would not have created the world whence came the incomprehensible intensity of this alarm for those young men were the bravest purest and most talented of the band both in dress and habits they were distinguished by a magnanimous recklessness and a noble simplicity a divine command bound them together to seek harder and more pious superiority what could be feared from them to what extent this fear was merely deceptive or simulated or really true is something that will probably never be exactly known but a strong instinct spoke out of this fear and out of its disgraceful and senseless persecution this instinct hated the birken shaft with an intense hatred for two reasons first of all on account of its organization as being the first attempt to construct a true educational institution and secondly on account of the spirit of this institution that earnest manly stern and daring german spirit that spirit of the minor son luther which has come down to us unbroken from the time of the reformation think of the fate of the Birkenschaft, when i ask you did the german university then understand that spirit as even the german princes in their hatred appear to have understood it did the alma mater boldly and resolutely throw her protecting arms 
round her noble sons and say you must kill me first before you touch my children i hear your answer by it you may judge whether the german university is an educational institution or not the student knew at that time at what depth a true educational institution must take root namely in an inward renovation and inspiration of the purest moral faculties and this must always be repeated to the student credit he may have learnt on the field of battle what he could learn least of all in the sphere of academical freedom that great leaders are necessary and that all culture begins with obedience and in the midst of victory with his thoughts turned to his liberated fatherland he made the vow that he would remain german german now he learned to understand his tacitus now he grasped the signification of kant's categorical imperative now he was enraptured by weber's lyre and sword songs the gates of philosophy of art yea even of antiquity opened unto him and in one of the most memorable of bloody acts the murder of kotzebue he revenged with penetrating insight and enthusiastic short-sightedness his one and only schiller prematurely consumed by the opposition of the stupid world schiller who could have been his leader master and organizer and whose loss he now bewailed with such heartfelt resentment for that was the doom of those promising students they did not find the leaders they wanted they gradually became uncertain discontented and at variance among themselves unlucky indiscretions showed only too soon that the one indispensability of powerful minds was lacking in the midst of them and while that mysterious murder gave evidence of astonishing strength it gave no less evidence of the grave danger arising from the want of a leader they were leaderless therefore they perished for i repeat it my friends all culture begins with the very opposite of that which is now so highly esteemed as academical freedom with obedience with subordination with discipline with subjection and as leaders must have followers so also must the followers have a leader here a certain reciprocal predisposition prevails in the hierarchy of spirits yea a kind of pre-established harmony this eternal hierarchy towards which all things naturally tend is always threatened by that pseudo-culture which now sits on the throne of the present it endeavours either to bring the leaders down to the level of its own servitude or else to cast them out altogether it seduces the followers when they are seeking their predestined leader and overcomes them by the fumes of its narcotics when however in spite of all this leader and followers have at last met wounded and sore there is an impassioned feeling of rapture like the echo of an ever-sounding lyre a feeling which i can let you divine only by means of a simile have you ever at a musical rehearsal looked at the strange shrivelled-up good-natured species of men who usually form the german orchestra what changes and fluctuations we see in that capricious goddess form what noses and ears what clumsy danse macabre movements just imagine for a moment that you were deaf and had never dreamed of the existence of sound or music and that you were looking upon the orchestra as a company of actors and trying to enjoy their performance as a drama and nothing more undisturbed by the idealizing effect of the sound you could never see enough of the stern mediaeval wood-cutting movement of this comical spectacle this harmonious parody on the homo sapiens now on the other hand assume that your musical sense has returned and that your ears are opened look at the honest conductor at the head of the orchestra performing his duties in a dull spiritless fashion you no longer think of the comical aspect of the whole scene you listen but it seems to you that the spirit of tediousness spreads out from the honest conductor over all his companions now you see only torpidity and flabbiness you hear only the trivial the rhythmically inaccurate and the melodiously trite you see the orchestra only as an indifferent ill-humoured and even wearisome crowd of players but set a genius a real genius in the midst of this crowd and you instantly perceive something almost incredible it is as if this genius 
in his lightning transmigration had entered into these mechanical lifeless bodies and as if only one demoniacal eye gleamed forth out of them all now look and listen you can never listen enough when you again observe the orchestra now loftily storming now fervently wailing when you notice the quick tightening of every muscle and the rhythmical necessity of every gesture then you too will feel what a pre-established harmony there is between leader and followers and now in the hierarchy of spirits everything impels us towards the establishment of a like organization you can divine from my simile what i would understand by a true educational institution and why i am very far from recognizing one in the present type of university End of section eight section nine of the complete works of friedrich nietzsche volume three this librivox recording is in the public domain homer and classical philology inaugural address delivered at basel university twenty eighth of may eighteen sixty nine at the present day no clear and consistent opinion seems to be held regarding classical philology we are conscious of this in the circles of the learned just as much as among the followers of that science itself the cause of this lies in its many-sided character in the lack of an abstract unity and in the inorganic aggregation of heterogeneous scientific activities which are connected with one another only by the name philology it must be freely admitted that philology is to some extent borrowed from several other sciences and is mixed together like a magic potion from the most outlandish liquors ores and bones it may even be added that it likewise conceals within itself an artistic element one which on aesthetic and ethical grounds may be called imperatival an element that acts in opposition to its purely scientific behaviour philology is composed of history just as much as of natural science or aesthetics history in so far as it endeavours to comprehend the manifestations of the individualities of peoples in ever new images and the prevailing law in the disappearance of phenomena natural science in so far as it strives to fathom the deepest instinct of man that of speech aesthetics finally because from various antiquities at our disposal it endeavours to pick out the so-called classical antiquity with a view and pretension of excavating the ideal world buried under it and to hold up to the present the mirror of the classical and everlasting standards that these wholly different scientific and aesthetico-ethical impulses have been associated under a common name a kind of sham monarchy is shown especially by the fact that philology at every period from its origin onwards was at the same time pedagogical from the standpoint of the pedagogue a choice was offered of those elements which were of the greatest educational value and thus that science or at least that scientific aim which we call philology gradually developed out of the practical calling originated by the exigencies of that science itself these philological aims were pursued sometimes with greater ardour and sometimes with less in accordance with the degree of culture and the development of the taste of a particular period but on the other hand the followers of this science are in the habit of regarding the aims which correspond to their 
several abilities as the aims of philology whence it comes about that the estimation of philology in public opinion depends upon the weight of the personalities of the philologists at the present time that is to say in a period which has seen men distinguished in almost every department of philology a general uncertainty of judgment has increased more and more and likewise a general relaxation of interest and participation in philological problems such an undecided and imperfect state of public opinion is damaging to a science in that its hidden and open enemies can work with much better prospects of success and philology has a great many such enemies where do we not meet with them these mockers always ready to aim a blow at the philological moles the animals that practise dust-eating ex professo and that grub up and eat for the eleventh time what they have already eaten ten times before for opponents of this sort however philology is merely a useless harmless and inoffensive pastime an object of laughter and not of hate but on the other hand there is a boundless and infuriated hatred of philology wherever an ideal as such is feared where the modern man falls down to worship himself and where hellenism is looked upon as a superseded and hence very insignificant point of view against these enemies we philologists must always count upon the assistance of artists and men of artistic minds for they alone can judge how the sword of barbarism sweeps over the head of every one who loses sight of the unutterable simplicity and noble dignity of the hellene and how no progress in commerce or technical industries however brilliant no school regulations no political education of the masses however widespread and complete can protect us from the curse of ridiculous and barbaric offences against good taste or from annihilation by the gorgon head of the classicist whilst philology as a whole is looked on with jealous eyes by these two classes of opponents there are numerous and varied hostilities in other directions of philology philologists themselves are quarrelling with one another internal dissensions are caused by useless disputes about precedents and mutual jealousies but especially by the differences even enmities comprised in the name of philology which are not however by any means naturally harmonized instincts science has this in common with art that the most ordinary everyday things appear to it as something entirely new and attractive as if metamorphosed by witchcraft and now seen for the first time life is worth living says art the beautiful temptress life is worth knowing says science with this contrast the so heart-rending and dogmatic tradition follows in a theory and consequently in the practice of classical philology derived from this theory we may consider antiquity from a scientific point of view we may try to look at what has happened with the eye of a historian or to arrange and compare the linguistic forms of ancient masterpieces to bring them at all events under a morphological law but we always lose the wonderful creative force the real fragrance of the atmosphere of antiquity we forget that passionate emotion which instinctively drove our meditation and enjoyment back to the greeks from this point onwards we must take notice of a clearly determined and very surprising antagonism which philology has great cause to regret from the circles upon whose help we must place the most implicit reliance the artistic friends of antiquity the warm supporters of hellenic beauty and noble simplicity 
we hear harsh voices crying out that it is precisely the philologists themselves who are the real opponents and destroyers of the ideals of antiquity schiller upbraided the philologists with having scattered homer's laurel crown to the winds it was none other than goethe who in early life a supporter of wolf's theories regarding homer recanted in the verses with subtle wit you took away our former adoration the iliad you may us say was mere conglomeration think it not crime in any way youth's fervent adoration leads us to know the verity and feel the poet's unity the reason of this want of piety and reverence must lie deeper and many are in doubt as to whether philologists are lacking in artistic capacity and impressions so that they are unable to do justice to the ideal or whether the spirit of negation has become a destructive and iconoclastic principle of theirs when however even the friends of antiquity possessed of such doubts and hesitations point to our present classical philology as something questionable what influence may we not ascribe to the outbursts of the realists and the claptrap of the heroes of the passing hour to answer the latter on this occasion especially when we consider the nature of the present assembly would be highly injudicious at any rate if i do not wish to meet with the fate of that sophist who when in sparta publicly undertook to praise and defend heracles when he was interrupted with the query but who then has found fault with him i cannot help thinking however that some of these scruples are still sounding in the ears of not a few in this gathering for they may still be frequently heard from the lips of noble and artistically gifted men as even an upright philologist must feel them and feel them most painfully at moments when his spirits are downcast for the single individual there is no deliverance from the dissensions referred to but what we contend and inscribe on our banner is the fact that classical philology as a whole has nothing whatsoever to do with the quarrels and bickerings of its individual disciples the entire scientific and artistic movement of this peculiar centaur is bent though with cyclopic slowness upon bridging over the gulf between the ideal antiquity which is perhaps only the magnificent blossoming of the teutonic longing for the south and the real antiquity and thus classical philology pursues only the final end of its own being which is the fusing together of primarily hostile impulses that have only forcibly been brought together let us talk as we will about the unattainability of this goal and even designate the goal itself as an illogical pretension the aspiration for it is very real and i should like to try to make it clear by an example that the most significant steps of classical philology never lead away from the ideal antiquity but to it and that just when people are speaking unwarrantably of the overthrow of sacred shrines new and more worthy altars are being erected let us then examine the so-called homeric question from this standpoint a question the most important problem of which schiller called a scholastic barbarism the important problem referred to is the question of the personality of homer we now meet everywhere with a firm opinion that the question of homer's personality is no longer timely and that it is quite a different thing from the real homeric question it may be added that for a given period such as our present philological period for example the centre of discussion may be removed from the problem of the poet's personality for even now 
a painstaking experiment is being made to reconstruct the homeric poems without the aid of personality treating them as the work of several different persons but if the centre of a scientific question is rightly seen to be where the swelling tide of new views has risen up that is where individual scientific investigation comes into contact with the whole life of science and culture if any one in other words indicates a historico cultural valuation as the central point of the question he must also in the province of homeric criticism take his stand upon the question of personality as being the really fruitful oasis in the desert of the whole argument for in homer the modern world i will not say has learnt but has examined a great historical point of view and even without now putting forward my own opinion as to whether this examination has been or can be happily carried out it was at all events the first example of the application of that productive point of view by it scholars learnt to recognize condensed beliefs in the apparently firm immobile figures of the life of ancient peoples by it they for the first time perceived the wonderful capability of the soul of a people to represent the conditions of its morals and beliefs in the form of a personality when historical criticism has confidently seized upon this method of evaporating apparently concrete personalities it is permissible to point to the first experiment as an important event in the history of sciences without considering whether it was successful in this instance or not it is a common occurrence for a series of striking signs and wonderful emotions to precede an epoch-making discovery even the experiment i have just referred to has its own attractive history but it goes back to a surprisingly ancient era friedrich august wolf has exactly indicated the spot where greek antiquity dropped the question the zenith of the historico literary studies of the greeks and hence also of their point of greatest importance the homeric question was reached in the age of the alexandrian grammarians up to this time the homeric question had run through the long chain of a uniform process of development of which the standpoint of those grammarians seemed to be the last link the last indeed which was attainable by antiquity they conceived the iliad and the odyssey as the creations of one single homer they declared it to be psychologically possible for two such different works to have sprung from the brain of one genius in contradiction to the corazontes who represented the extreme limit of the scepticism of a few detached individuals of antiquity rather than antiquity itself considered as a whole to explain the different general impression of the two books on the assumption that one poet composed them both scholars sought assistance by referring to the seasons of the poet's life and compared the poet of the odyssey to the setting sun the eyes of those critics were tirelessly on the lookout for discrepancies in the language and thoughts of the two poems but at this time also a history of the homeric poem and its tradition was prepared according to which these discrepancies were not due to homer but to those who committed his words to writing and those who sang them it was believed that homer's poem was passed from one generation to another viva voce and faults were attributed to the improvising and at times forgetful bards at a certain given date about the time of pisistratus the poems which had been repeated orally were said to have been collected in manuscript form but the scribes it is added allowed themselves to take some liberties with the text by transposing some lines and adding extraneous matter here and there 
this entire hypothesis is the most important in the domain of literary studies that antiquity has exhibited and the acknowledgment of the dissemination of the homeric poems by word of mouth as opposed to the habits of a book learned age shows in particular a depth of ancient sagacity worthy of our admiration from those times until the generation that produced friedrich august wolf we must take a jump over a long historical vacuum but in our own age we find the argument left just as it was at the time when the power of controversy departed from antiquity and it is a matter of indifference to us that wolf accepted as certain tradition what antiquity itself had set up only as a hypothesis it may be remarked as most characteristic of this hypothesis that in the strictest sense the personality of homer is treated seriously that a certain standard of inner harmony is everywhere presupposed in the manifestations of the personality and that with these two excellent auxiliary hypotheses whatever is seen to be below this standard and opposed to this inner harmony is at once swept aside as unhomeric but even this distinguishing characteristic in place of wishing to recognize the supernatural existence of a tangible personality ascends likewise through all the stages that lead to that zenith with ever-increasing energy and clearness individuality is ever more strongly felt and accentuated the psychological possibility of a single homer is ever more forcibly demanded if we descend backwards from this zenith step by step we find a guide to the understanding of the homeric problem in the person of aristotle homer was for him the flawless and untiring artist who knew his end and the means to attain it but there is still a trace of infantile criticism to be found in aristotle that is in the naive concession he made to the public opinion that considered homer as the author of the original of all comic epics the margetus if we go still further backwards from aristotle the inability to create a personality is seen to increase more and more poems are attributed to homer and every period lets us see its degree of criticism by how much and what it considers as homeric in this backward examination we instinctively feel that away beyond herodotus there lies a period in which an immense flood of great epics has been identified with the name of homer let us imagine ourselves as living in the time of pisistratus the word homer then comprehended an abundance of dissimilarities what was meant by homer at that time it is evident that that generation found itself unable to grasp a personality and the limits of its manifestations homer had now become of small consequence and then we meet with the weighty question what lies before this period has homer's personality because it cannot be grasped gradually faded away into an empty name or had all the homeric poems been gathered together in a body the nation naively representing itself by the figure of homer was the person created out of a conception or the conception out of a person this is the real homeric question the central problem of the personality the difficulty of answering this question however is increased when we seek a reply in another direction from the standpoint of the poems themselves which have come down to us as it is difficult for us at the present day and necessitates a serious effort on our part to understand the law of gravitation clearly that the earth alters its form of motion when another heavenly body changes its position in space although no material connection unites one to the other it likewise costs us some trouble to obtain a clear impression of that wonderful problem which like a coin 
long passed from hand to hand has lost its original and highly conspicuous stamp poetical works which cause the hearts of even the greatest geniuses to fail when they endeavour to vie with them and in which unsurpassable images are held up for the admiration of posterity and yet the poet who wrote them with only a hollow shaky name whenever we do lay hold on him nowhere the solid kernel of a powerful personality for who would wage war with the gods who even with the one god asked gerda even who though a genius strove in vain to solve the mysterious problem of the homeric inaccessibility the conception of popular poetry seemed to lead like a bridge over this problem a deeper and more original power than that of every single creative individual was said to have become active the happiest people in the happiest period of its existence in the highest activity of fantasy and formative power was said to have created those immeasurable poems in this universality there is something almost intoxicating in the thought of a popular poem we feel with artistic pleasure the broad overpowering liberation of a popular gift and we delight in this natural phenomenon as we do in an uncontrollable cataract but as soon as we examine this thought at close quarters we involuntarily put a poetic mass of people in the place of the poetizing soul of the people a long row of popular poets in whom individuality has no meaning and in whom the tumultuous movement of a people's soul the intuitive strength of a people's eye and the unabated profusion of a people's fantasy were once powerful a row of original geniuses attached to a time to a poetic genus to a subject matter such a conception justly made people suspicious could it be possible that that same nature who so sparingly distributed her rarest and most precious production genius should suddenly take the notion of lavishing her gifts in one sole direction and here the thorny question again made its appearance could we not get along with one genius only and explain the present existence of that unattainable excellence and now eyes were keenly on the lookout for whatever that excellence and singularity might consist of impossible for it to be in the construction of the complete works said one party for this is far from faultless but doubtless to be found in single songs in the single pieces above all not in the whole a second party on the other hand sheltered themselves beneath the authority of aristotle who especially admired homer's divine nature in the choice of his entire subject and the manner in which he planned and carried it out if however this construction was not clearly seen this fault was due to the way the poems were handed down to posterity and not to the poet himself it was the result of retouchings and interpolations owing to which the original setting of the work gradually became obscured the more the first school looked for inequalities contradictions perplexities the more energetically did the other school brush aside what in their opinion obscured the original plan in order if possible that nothing might be left remaining but the actual words of the original epic itself the second school of thought of course held fast by the conception of an epic-baking genius as the composer of the great works the first school on the other hand wavered between the supposition of one genius plus a number of minor poets and another hypothesis which assumed only a number of superior and even mediocre individual bards but also postulated a mysterious discharging a deep national artistic impulse which shows itself in individual minstrels as an almost indifferent medium it is to this latter school that we must attribute the representation of the homeric poems as the expression of that mysterious impulse all these schools of thought start from the assumption that the problem of the present form of these epics can be solved from the standpoint of an aesthetic judgment but we must await the decision as to the authorized line of demarcation between the man of genius 
and the poetical soul of the people are there characteristic differences between the utterances of the man of genius and the poetical soul of the people this whole contrast however is unjust and misleading there is no more dangerous assumption in modern aesthetics than that of popular poetry and individual poetry or as it is usually called artistic poetry this is the reaction or if you will the superstition which followed upon the most momentous discovery of historico philological science the discovery and appreciation of the soul of the people for this discovery prepared the way for a coming scientific view of history which was until then and in many respects is even now a mere collection of materials with the prospect that new materials would continue to be added and that the huge overflowing pile would never be systematically arranged the people now understood for the first time that the long-felt power of greater individualities and wills was larger than the pitifully small will of an individual man they now saw that everything truly great in the kingdom of the will could not have its deepest root in the inefficacious and ephemeral individual will and finally they now discovered the powerful instincts of the masses and diagnosed those unconscious impulses to be the foundations and supports of the so-called universal history but the newly lighted flame also cast its shadow and this shadow was none other than that superstition already referred to which popular poetry set up in opposition to individual poetry and thus enlarged the comprehension of the people's soul to that of the people's mind by the misapplication of attempting analogical inference people had reached the point of applying in the domain of the intellect and artistic ideas that principle of greater individuality which is truly applicable only in the domain of the will the masses have never experienced more flattering treatment than in thus having the laurel of genius set upon their empty heads it was imagined that new shells were forming round a small kernel so to speak and that those pieces of popular poetry originated like avalanches in the drift and flow of tradition they were however ready to consider that kernel as being of the smallest possible dimensions so that they might occasionally get rid of it altogether without losing anything of the mass of the avalanche according to this view the text itself and the stories built round it are one and the same thing now however such a contrast between popular poetry and individual poetry does not exist at all on the contrary all poetry and of course popular poetry also requires an intermediary individuality this much abused contrast therefore is necessary only when the term individual poem is understood to mean a poem which has not grown out of the soil of popular feeling but which has been composed by a non-popular poet in a non-popular atmosphere something which has come to maturity in the study of a learned man for example with the superstition which presupposes poetizing masses is connected another that popular poetry is limited to one particular period of a people's history and afterwards dies out which indeed follows as a consequence of the first superstition i have mentioned according to this school in the place of the gradually decaying popular poetry we have artistic poetry the work of individual minds not of masses of people but the same powers which were once active are still so and the form in which they act has remained exactly the same the great poet of a literary period is still a popular poet in no narrower sense than the popular poet of an illiterate age the difference between them is not in the way they originate but it is their diffusion and propagation in short tradition this tradition is exposed to eternal danger without the help of handwriting and runs the risk of including in the poems the remains of those individualities through whose oral tradition they were handed down 
if we apply all these principles to the homeric poems it follows that we gain nothing with our theory of the poetizing soul of the people and that we are always referred back to the poetical individual we are thus confronted with the task of distinguishing that which can have originated only in a single poetical mind from that which is so to speak swept up by the tide of oral tradition and which is a highly important constituent part of the homeric poems since literary history first ceased to be a mere collection of names people have attempted to grasp and formulate the individualities of the poets a certain mechanism forms part of the method it must be explained that is it must be deduced from principles why this or that individuality appears in this way and not in that people now study biographical details environment acquaintances contemporary events and believe that by mixing all these ingredients together they will be able to manufacture the wished for individuality but they forget that the punctum saliens the indefinable individual characteristics can never be obtained from a compound of this nature the less there is known about the life and times of the poet the less applicable is this mechanism when however we have merely the works and the name of the writer it is almost impossible to detect the individuality at all events for those who put their faith in the mechanism in question and particularly when the works are perfect when they are pieces of popular poetry for the best way for these mechanicians to grasp individual characteristics is by perceiving deviations from the genius of the people the aberrations and hidden allusions and the fewer discrepancies to be found in a poem the fainter will be the traces of the individual poet who composed it all those deviations everything dull and below the ordinary standard which scholars think they perceive in the homeric poems were attributed to tradition which thus became the scapegoat what was left of homer's own individual work nothing but a series of beautiful and prominent passages chosen in accordance with subjective taste the sum total of aesthetic singularity which every individual scholar perceived with his own artistic gifts he now called homer this is the central point of the homeric errors the name of homer from the very beginning has no connection either with the conception of aesthetic perfection or yet with the iliad and the odyssey homer as the composer of the iliad and the odyssey is not a historical tradition but an aesthetic judgment the only path which leads back beyond the time of pisistratus and helps us to elucidate the meaning of the name homer takes its way on the one hand through the reports which have reached us concerning homer's birthplace from which we see that although his name is always associated with heroic epic poems he is on the other hand no more referred to as the composer of the iliad and the odyssey than as the author of the thebaeus or any other cyclical epic on the other hand again an old tradition tells of the contest between homer and hesiod which proves that when these two names were mentioned people instinctively thought of two epic tendencies the heroic and the didactic and that the signification of the name homer was included in the material category and not in the formal this imaginary contest with hesiod did not even yet show the faintest presentiment of individuality from the time of pisistratus onwards however with the surprisingly rapid development of the greek feeling for beauty the differences in the aesthetic value of those epics continued to be felt more and more the iliad and the odyssey arose from the depths of the flood and have remained on the surface ever since with this process of aesthetic separation the conception of homer gradually became narrower the old material meaning of the name homer as the father of the heroic epic poem was changed into the aesthetic meaning of homer the father of poetry in general and likewise its original prototype this transformation was contemporary with the rationalistic criticism which made homer the magician out to be a possible poet 
which vindicated the material and formal traditions of those numerous epics as against the unity of the poet and gradually removed that heavy load of cyclical epics from homer's shoulders so homer the poet of the iliad and the odyssey is an aesthetic judgment it is however by no means affirmed against the poet of these epics that he was merely the imaginary being of an aesthetic impossibility which can be the opinion of only very few philologists indeed the majority contend that a single individual was responsible for the general design of a poem such as the iliad and further that this individual was homer the first part of this contention may be admitted but in accordance with what i have said the latter part must be denied and i very much doubt whether the majority of those who adopt the first part of the contention have taken the following considerations into account the design of an epic such as the iliad is not an entire whole not an organism but a number of pieces strung together a collection of reflections arranged in accordance with aesthetic rules it is certainly the standard of an artist's greatness to know what he can take in with a single glance and set out in rhythmical form the infinite profusion of images and incidents in the homeric epic must force us to admit that such a wide range of vision is next to impossible where however a poet is unable to observe artistically with a single glance he usually piles conception on conception and endeavours to adjust his characters according to a comprehensive scheme he will succeed in this all the better the more he is familiar with the fundamental principles of aesthetics he will even make some believe that he made himself master of the entire subject by a single powerful glance the iliad is not a garland but a bunch of flowers as many pictures as possible are crowded on one canvas but the man who placed them there was indifferent as to whether the grouping of the collected pictures was invariably suitable and rhythmically beautiful he well knew that no one would ever consider the collection as a whole but would merely look at the individual parts but that stringing together of some pieces as the manifestations of a grasp of art which was not yet highly developed still less thoroughly comprehended and generally esteemed cannot have been the real homeric deed the real homeric epoch-making event on the contrary this design is a later product far later than homer's celebrity those therefore who look for the original and perfect design are looking for a mere phantom for the dangerous path of oral tradition had reached its end just as the systematic arrangement appeared on the scene the disfigurements which were caused on the way could not have affected the design for this did not form part of the material handed down from generation to generation the relative imperfection of the design must not however prevent us from seeing in the designer a different personality from the real poet it is not only probable that everything which was created in those times with conscious aesthetic insight was infinitely inferior to the songs that sprang up naturally in the poet's mind and were written down with instinctive power we can even take a step further if we include the so-called cyclic poems in this comparison there remains for the designer of the iliad and the odyssey the indisputable merit of having done something relatively great in this conscious technical composing a merit which we might have been prepared to recognize from the beginning and which is in my opinion of the very first order in the domain of instinctive creation we may even be ready to pronounce this synthesization of great importance all those dull passages and discrepancies deemed of such importance but really only subjective which we usually look upon as the petrified remains of the period of tradition are not these perhaps merely the almost necessary evils which must fall to the lot of the poet of genius who undertakes a composition virtually without a parallel and further one which proves to be of incalculable difficulty 
let it be noted that the insight into the most diverse operations of the instinctive and the conscious changes the position of the homeric problem and in my opinion throws light upon it we believe in a great poet as the author of the iliad and the odyssey but not that homer was this poet the decision on this point has already been given the generation that invented those numerous homeric fables that poetized the myth of the contest between homer and hesiod and looked upon all the poems of the epic cycle as homeric did not feel an aesthetic but a material singularity when it pronounced the name homer this period regards homer as belonging to the ranks of artists like orpheus eumolpus daedalus and olympus the mythical discoverers of a new branch of art to whom therefore all the later fruits which grew from the new branch were thankfully dedicated and that wonderful genius to whom we owe the iliad and the odyssey belongs to this thankful posterity he too sacrificed his name on the altar of the primeval father of the homeric epic homerus up to this point gentlemen i think i have been able to put before you the fundamental philosophical and aesthetic characteristics of the problem of the personality of homer keeping all minor details rigorously at a distance on the supposition that the primary form of this widespread and honeycombed mountain known as the homeric question can be most clearly observed by looking down at it from a far-off height but i have also i imagine recalled two facts to those friends of antiquity who take such delight in accusing us philologists of lack of piety for great conceptions and an unproductive zeal for destruction in the first place those great conceptions such for example as that of the indivisible and inviolable poetic genius homer were during the pre wolfian period only too great and hence inwardly altogether empty and elusive when we now try to grasp them if classical philology goes back again to the same conceptions and once more tries to pour new wine into old bottles it is only on the surface that the conceptions are the same everything has really become new bottle and mind wine and word we everywhere find traces of the fact that philology has lived in company with poets thinkers and artists for the last hundred years whence it has now come about that the heap of ashes formerly pointed to as classical philology is now turned into fruitful and even rich soil and there is a second fact which i should like to recall to the memory of those friends of antiquity who turned their dissatisfied backs on classical philology you honour the immortal masterpieces of the hellenic mind in poetry and sculpture and think yourselves so much more fortunate than preceding generations which had to do without them but you must not forget that this whole fairyland once lay buried under mountains of prejudice and that the blood and sweat and arduous labour of innumerable followers of our science were all necessary to lift up that world from the chasm into which it had sunk we grant that philology is not the creator of this world nor the composer of that immortal music but is it not a merit and a great merit to be a mere virtuoso and let the world for the first time hear that music which lay so long in obscurity despised and undecipherable who was homer previously to wolf's brilliant investigations a good old man known at best as a natural genius at all events the child of a barbaric age replete with faults against good taste and good morals let us hear how a learned man of the first rank writes about homer even so late as seventeen eighty three where does the good man live why did he remain so long incognito apropos can't you get me a silhouette of him we demand thanks not in our own name for we are but atoms but in the name of philology itself which is indeed neither a muse nor a grace but a messenger of the gods and just as the muses descended upon the dull and tormented boeotian peasants so philology comes into a world full of gloomy colours and pictures full of the deepest most incurable woes and speaks to men comfortingly of the beautiful and godlike figure of a distant rosy and happy fairyland 
it is time to close yet before i do so a few words of a personal character must be added justified i hope by the occasion of this lecture it is but right that a philologist should describe his end and the means to it in the short formula of a confession of faith and let this be done in the saying of seneca which i thus reverse philosophia facta est quae philologia fuit by this i wish to signify that all philological activities should be enclosed and surrounded by a philosophical view of things in which everything individual and isolated is evaporated as something detestable and in which great homogeneous views alone remain now therefore that i have enunciated my philological creed i trust you will give me cause to hope that i shall no longer be a stranger among you give me the assurance that in working with you towards this end i am worthily fulfilling the confidence with which the highest authorities of this community have honoured me end of section nine end of the complete works of friedrich nietzsche volume three